Good evening. We have uh, tonight and next Tuesday, and then we have a long time out for Pesach. We'll be back after. I just want to bring to your attention that I have a new app now. This whole app was uh, upgraded. It's much, much, much better now. You have a search box. You can search by topics. You can download lectures. You have video, audio. You have Hebrew menu. English, everything you need. So it's, Baruch Hashem, uh, it was about over two months that the app wasn't functioning right. Like they say in Hebrew, Me'az Yatsa Matok. Now it's working beautifully. Uh, we will speak a little bit about uh, Parashat Vaikra. We write before Pesach, uh, Sefer Vaikra. It's a, it's a book that took basically in the history only one month. Sefer Bereshit took 2,200 years, the book of Genesis. Parashat Bereshit, the first parasha of Bereshit, took 1,400 years, 1,400 years. So one parasha took 1,400 years in history, and the whole Sefer Bereshit, uh, Vaikra took one month, one month only. So you see that the Torah is not a history book that it divides it based on X amount of years equally. It's nothing to do, I mean, it happened to also tell history, but it definitely wasn't the purpose. Today was Rosh Chodesh Nisan. What's special about Rosh Chodesh Nisan? That was the, the, the day that we built the Mishkan for the first time, in the second year after we came out of Egypt. The temporary Bet Mikdash, the portable temple, was built for the first time. It was today. It was a very holy day. It's starting the holiest month of the year, together with the month of Tishrei as well. But it's a very special month. It's such a good month that the entire month... <laughs> that the entire... What about clapping? Next time you give him a round of applause when he comes. Give him a round of applause, you know, next time. But why are you always late? That's the question. So the, the, the Sefer of Nisan, the, the month of Nisan, is such a good month that you don't make confessions the entire month. There's no Yag Midot, no Vidui, the entire month. Why is it? It's time of mercy, time of Geulah, time of redemption. Vaikra Hashem el Moshe. Vaikra, it's written in a very strange way in the Torah with a small aleph. There's few places in the Torah that there's a small letter, that it's not regular size. Even when you write in the original Torah or when you print the Chumashim, it always comes with a small aleph. So technically it looks more like Vaikar, not Vaikra. Vaikar, it's like we say in the Megillat Esther, Kacha Yaseh Melech Asher Aish Chafetz Bikaro. That Hashem is interested in your interest, meaning to praise you, to elevate you. So, Vaikar Hashem el Moshe, the whole idea here is to tell us about the importance of Moshe, and Moshe is very humble, down to earth. And also, the reason why the letter is small is giving us a hint that the world is standing on the pure Torah of the children. The children that are not bar mitzvah yet, they did not have any of the sins, even if they make do certain things that it's against the Torah, none of those sins sticks to their neshama yet. Like when you become older, it makes an impact on the soul. So Evel P.M. Shel Tinokot Shel Bet Rabban, the world is actually surviving thanks to the Torah, the pure Torah of the children. The Gemara brings an example that the greatest rabbis in history, they ask, what about our Torah? We give our life for the Torah, we don't stop. And uh, the answer was, our Torah, with all due respect, is not as pure as the Torah as the children. Why? It's not the same when you have sins and you learn Torah, and when you have no sins and you learn Torah. It's a whole different league. Then the Gemara say, well, if we have sins, you did not live life to any human being. <laughs> I mean, we, we are so careful not to make one sin in 10 years. What kind of sins we have? 
but sometimes even a tiny, tiny sin that in our vocabulary it's not even a sin. We may even think it's a mitzvah according to their level. It's very, very strict. In this parasha we also learn that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is very, very strict with the righteous people. Much more than the ordinary people. And an ordinary person, Hashem has a lot of patience for him and is waiting for him and giving him enough chances to do tshuva. By the righteous people, Hashem is very, very strict with them. And it makes perfectly sense. Why? Like I always give this example. If you have a few sons, one of them is a genius and the rest are not something special. They barely understand English. So now when one of them gets 60 on a test, you're happy. No? This fool, Baruch Hashem, got 60 this time. Not always get 40, this time 60. Well, give him a cake. Then when the other one gets 95, you get angry. What is this? What? It's 95. It's the best mark in the class. I don't care about the class. What class? 95? You practically fail. Why is it I get 95, I get yelled at, and he gets 60 and you give him a cake? The answer, from you I expect. Therefore you let me down. From him, anything he gets, it's nothing surprising. Get zero, zero. <laughs> what should I expect? You understand? The same thing with the tzaddikim. You're in such a level and you make such scenes like a little ordinary person. From you I expect. Since from you I expect and you know better, I am much more strict with you than I am with ordinary people. So we have an understanding here how it works. Now the, the Gemara asks a question, it's basically not fair. In that case, why should I even be a tzaddik? Let me stay ordinary for the rest of my life. Like this, I'll, Hashem won't be strict with me. Why will I elevate myself to such a level and then when I make a mistake, Hashem is going to punch me full force. <coughs> Let me stay a fool. And like this, here and there I get a small smack and I'm happy. Why should I know too much, right? Did you ever see a person in this world that really think like that? i give you an example. A person is a, a, person is a, a, law, a regular judge in a civil court. He has small cases, you know, here, there, divorce case, delegation, not matters of life and death or that it changed humanity. And he's dreaming to be a judge in a Supreme Court. Why would you want the responsibility, you fool? They're going to ask you to be God now. You have to decide for abortions. Millions of people will get murdered. It's all on your blood. You're going to sign it. Every one of them that will die, you're going to have to pay like you killed him. Why do you want this responsibility? You have to decide if to let Arab come into the country. They're going to murder thousands of Americans. It's going to be all your responsibility. Why do you want it? But every, every judge, if you ask him, you want to be a judge in the Supreme Court, 99 out of 100 would say, it's my dream. I don't think I have a chance, but it's my dream. Same thing a person. Why would he want to be the prime minister of Israel? So much responsibilities. So much stress dealing with the Mossad, dealing with the Shabak, dealing with the army, dealing with the government, dealing with the lefties, dealing with the reform Americans who donate money and they want results, and dealing with the Haredim, which are anti-reform, have to satisfy everyone all day. They butcher your wife on the media. and this. Who wants this job? You could have made millions of dollars just being a, an advisor to some company, living the life, having servants, again being on a boat, enjoying life, enjoying the sun, reading some books, watching some movies according to his standards, and enjoy life. What does he need his headache? Getting up five in the morning, going to sleep two at night, non-stop headache, even on Shabbat, emergencies, you try to come to the holiday, to the synagogue, two minutes, right away they call you up, terrorist attack, a threat, move from here, hiding you in a cave. Why do you need all this? The whole world hates you, you have to prepare speeches. Why do you need this? <laughs> For the salary? For sure not. How much a prime minister make? How much Obama was making? 300,000 a year. Now in a speech he's going to make it. There's enough fools to pay him. Instead of making him pay to give him to, you know, a chance to speak, 
they will give him $300,000 to come speak. So in one speech, he's going to make more than he made a year with all the stress and the headache of being a president. So technically, logically, everyone should have run away from key jobs that have full responsibilities. But reality-wise, everyone run after these jobs. So what's going on here? <laughs> what motivates the people to try to get to those jobs, even though it's mamash can destroy you for eternity, the decisions you're going to make, you're not going to get away with that. It's a very interesting thing here. Huh? So it's all for the honor? It's all ego. I am the strongest person in a country or in a world. Or I am in charge of people's life. It's a combination of this and also stupidity. <laughs> Why it's stupidity? Because really, if you're a smart person, you would run away from it. When you're a big rabbi, you don't have a choice. If you run away from it, you may get punished for it. But if you don't want to be the president of the United States, no one will punish you for that. I don't want to be a president. I want to be a senator. Ah, it's enough for me. It's enough headache. I don't want to be a president. No, no, you're the one. You, you are worthy. We want you to run. You be the head of the Democrats or the Republicans. No, 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 my wife doesn't want. I have a sick child. He can give you excuses. They leave him alone. Nobody punish him. Definitely not God. But if you're a very big Tamid Chacham, and you run away, and Hashem wants you to be a leader, and you run away, and somebody else becomes a leader, and is much worse, and because of that everybody suffers, you're going to be responsible, just like everything else in life. Why did you get to this level to run away from running the show? Okay, I understand you're humble, I understand you don't want honor, but now it's not about this now. Now it's about saving the life of millions. So this is the whole idea here that the Gemara asks, why would a person want to be a big tzaddik and a big talmid chacham if n knowing that it will, it will bring Hashem to be much stricter with him than other people, right? The answer for the same reason I just gave you. Nobody thinks I'm going to be great that one day I'll be the general in the army or the president or the big judge even though it comes with a lot of responsibility and I may pay the price, everyone runs to that target. People want it. Same thing over here. You want to be a big tzaddik and a big tamid chacham because even if Hashem is strict with you and he will punish you severely here more than other people, don't forget the whole picture. The punishment here can be how many years? 5, 10, 20? And it's over. It's a blink of the eye. Then later for all the merit that you have and all the mitzvot you kept, eternity is not even the beginning of how much you're going to benefit from it. So you worry about the punishment here and there and the suffering of 5, 10, 20 years compared to billions and trillions of years of pleasure and you worry. One person wrote to me an email today. And this was the email. He said, I came to the conclusion that I have to stop all my donations to all the good Torah causes. And it's not because I'm not making money. Business is fine. I make the same amount of money. Is he donating money monthly? The reason I decided to stop my donations, who can guess why? I'll give you one chance. Guess. Why he decided to stop his donations to all different rabbis that he knows and like. Why? If you think because he found that the rabbis are not real and they're fakers and all kinds of things like this, this time it's not the case. If you think he wants to cut his donation because he was making 10 million and now he makes 9.5 million, it's also not the case. Because business, as usual, he makes money. So what could be the reason? What do you think? Huh? Clever. No. <laughs> uh, what do you think? No. He didn't speak a word about Maser. Guess what? I'll tell you the answer. Because he wrote in an email, because I came to the conclusion that someone like me, it's not worthy 
of giving donations. I am a faker. On one hand, I do good things. On the other hand, I'm not a modest person. It is personal life, I guess, ladies, whatever the case may be. So therefore, I don't think that they, they want my filthy money from someone wicked like me. So this is what he said. Now what would you answer him? Huh? Almost every person thinks like that at least once in his life. What am I giving donations when I'm such a faker or I did such a scene or I'm doing that scene or, you know, I don't even have so much emunah or I'm not so religious. A lot of people think like that. But he decided to do something. Now, what would you answer him? So I tell you what's the answer to this question. Someone that has a car that got stuck in the mud it's pressing the gas, it's stuck in the mud or in the snow. So if someone told him the car is too heavy, you gotta just throw everything out of the car, like this will be lighter, you'll be able to get out. So it's a good idea. So he took the four wheels, each wheel is very heavy. He took out the four wheels and threw them on the side and now he pressed the gas. Someone like this, what, what are you going to say about him? So it's similar to this guy. The only chance you have to get saved or maybe one do to be a righteous person is when you finally give donations and give a part of your life, meaning it takes you X amount of hours to make this money and you give it to others or you give it to make Jews religious or to, for Jews there to be able to learn more Torah. So now you're doing something bad. And you, and you do something good. So let's say you're 50-50 or 60-40. Now you want to take the good that you do and put it in the garbage to be 100% wicked. What kind of a logic is this? No, I don't agree with what you're saying. Well, right, let's hear. Because if he heard from a rabbi that tells him that all the money that he's making is making it from Gezel. No, I didn't say Gezel. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Modesty, not Gezel. Okay. One second. Because you're making the money from Gezel. No. All the donations giving are meaningless if it's, if it's giving money that she goes out. This is, this is the parush. No, but that's not the case. We didn't say Gezel. We say clearly that he has modesty issues. Something with, the, I guess, a girl or who knows. Something not modest, no? We didn't go into details. By the way, even about Gezel, what you say, it's clearly against Shulchan Aruch, what you say. Shulchan Aruch say, are you allowed to take donation from a thief? You know he's a thief. It's on the news every other week that he stole from here, he robbed the bank, he robbed cars. Yeah, and he came to a rabbi and he wants to give a donation. What's the halacha? If he has one legitimate source of income, let's say he has a restaurant. In a restaurant, he sells food and he gets money. So he's not stealing. He makes money in a restaurant or shoe store. Or, you know, a business that generates legit income. He may be a mafia guy, he may be blackmail people, he may kill people and get money for, for killing. He may do a lot of bad things. But if we know that he owns a restaurant, this is his restaurant, this mafia guy. Or he owns a clothing store, or, you know, a company of car service. The mafia people, they invest in a lot of legitimate businesses. Because when they come to investigate them, they ask you, where you get your money? They say, here, from the restaurant, here, from the stores, here, I bought these uh, department stores. So they invest in a lot of money, stocks. Why? They don't want all their money to come from drugs and killing and blackmail and protection. They also want to make legitimate money. So if some of the money that they make is legitimate, the Shulchan Aruch say, Tolim, you say that the money he donated came from the kosher part of his income. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. But let me ask you a question. The person, the person that donate, you tell him which one, which, if you give us from the from the drugs money, we won't be able to. No, no. Listen, we won't be able to know. If you give us from the bad money, we won't be able to take it. Unbelievable. Can we make sure that we 
Maybe it's better he will text like he does. As soon as he stops texting, he wins the shiur. <laughs> Keep sending him texts that he'll have what to look at. <laughs> so the idea is, if we tell a person, I can only take it from you if it comes from your kosher part of the income, what would he say? Of course, here, let me give you from the kosher one. He wants to do something good. If he knows that he'll give you for money that he won't count for him, he won't give at all. He'll go buy himself a nice suit with that. Why would he give it to you? He wants to give money to relax his conscience. Oh, so now you may come and say, okay, so why should I help him to relax his conscience? It's a killer. I should, not, I should make him feel guilty. Why should I help him to give donation like this? He feel not as bad. The answer is, you're right, technically, but can you prevent a Jew from doing a mitzvah just because he's wicked? That's the question. He does a lot of bad, but now he wants to do something good. He wants to eat matzah in your house on Lela Pesach, Lela Seder. You say to him, don't come to me, you mechalel Shabbat, eat bread. Don't come to eat matzah. You rasha, you filthy. We don't want you to eat matzah. We are allowed to do such thing. If you do it, you get punished. So if he wants to give tzedakah, assuming that not all his money is stolen. If all his money is not kosher, it's clearly you're not allowed to accept from him. Like you said, it's not his money. What are you taking it from him? But if some of it is income that it's kosher, you're allowed to take. So now, if you tell the person, I don't want to take from you tzedakah, you're actually taking away maybe his only chance to get saved. Because we know in the Gemara it says, tzedakah tatzil mimavet. Maybe he's supposed to die next week. If you're the Baba Sali, he was able to know which money to take to what. We don't know. Even if I suspect that probability, you know, most probably, that it's not kosher, or I have suspicion. I say, yes, sure, give it to me. But I use it for toilet paper or something not such a kosher thing. As you are. Right. It's written in the books that if someone like that, even Mechalel Shabbat, you don't need even to talk about a thief or, or a murderer. A regular good hard Jew, that is not Shomer Shabbat. So what's if you know that this money was made on Shabbat, what's, what blessing this money will have? Can I use his money if I know that he's a thief, but he has a kosher record? You pay the electric bill, you pay the cleaning people, can I you pay the mortgage. Can I use his money to build the shul? To build the shul, it's a little bit problematic. Not only that, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai used to take his Talmidim when they used to do a special prayers and something special outside of the building. Why? Because it was built by idol worshippers goyim. See, we in Israel, we lucky that the Arabs are not idol worshippers. If Christians will build the buildings, then it's idol worshippers. It's a big problem. Arabs, they may want to kill us, but they're not idol worshippers. So, the, so, yeah, so, so now you ask me, what, which one is worse? To be an idol worshiper, Christian, a nice civilized guy from Harvard University who bowed down to JC on Sundays? Or Mustafa that slaughtered people for the ISIS? Which one is really worse? The answer, the Christian one is worse. The idol worshiper is worse than a murderer, just like Michalel Shabbat is worse than a murderer. That's what Hashem said, not me. If I wrote the Torah, then you say, how come? Where is your logic? What the Torah, what I can... The shoe understood, no, cannot use this money. What else I cannot use this money? You can use it for maintenance things. So for what? Tea, coffee, painting a little bit here buying and there. The books, buying the books in the shoe. Not good. Things that go directly to the cause of the mitzvah, not good. <laughs> but again, this is only if you know that this person is a thief or a murderer or an idol worshiper. If it's a, for instance... If he is a decent guy, he's Shomer Sheva Mitzvot Bnei Noach, he loves Hashem, he's not an idol worshiper, he loves Jews, he's a good heart, and he wants to do something for the temple. You allowed? Yes. 100%. We have in a Gemara that they accepted from some of the goyim gifts for Bet HaMikdash. So no question about it. It's, it's perfectly fine, and he deserves also the merit. The problem is, all the, that's what a lot of people don't know. A lot of ignorant people, when they read the Talmud, they see that the Chachamim spoke negatively against some of the Goyim. They don't understand that the Chachamim, 
when they spoke negatively against Goim, was only against Akum. Always in the Gemara, Akum. Of they, Kochavim Umazalot, those who bow down to the sun, to the moon, and to the star, and to all kinds of statues. When they spoke negative against them, there was only the idol worshippers. But when it was a righteous, righteous Goim, they never spoke bad against them. Yov was a prophet of Hashem. He was a Goy. What's so he going to speak against the prophet of Hashem? A lot of the ignorance, they don't understand that. They think that the Gemara is racist, that Jews don't like Goim, and that's why the Chachamim always spoke negative against them. Not, not true. The opposite, for instance, the Gemara said the Persians are modest people. Persians of the old days. They give them compliments. And sometimes in the Gemara it says that the Chachamim and the Goim had an argument, and the Chachamim admitted that the Goim were right. And it's written in the Talmud. You don't find it in the Quran that a Muslim Kadi had an argument with a rabbi, and he writes that the rabbi was right. He also won't find it in the New Testament. But in the Talmud, you find it at least a hundred times. Where does it say that we were the prophet? Yehov Haya Navi. The biggest tzaddik also. No, it says that the Satan came to, the Satan came to Hashem, he said, who is like Avraham Avinu? And he said to him, go, go to Yov. Well, check this later. Yov, we have a part of the Tanakh comes from Yov. So isn't it one of the Sheva Nevim of the, of the Goim? Yov? Even if he's not, he was a very big tzaddik. Okay, so now if someone speak against him, right? If they speak against him, it's against what Hashem wants, right? Okay. So now, Vaikra Hashem el Moshe, it says in Mishlei, in, in Proverbs, Ga'avat Adam Tashpilenu. When a person has, when a person has pride, it's just a matter of time until the pride will bury him all the way down, will bring him down. Why? Hashem cannot stand proud people. Someone that wants to be on top of everyone, wants to be in control, wants to get honor, immediately all of that things that he runs after will run away from him. And now the Gemara gives a few examples. Shaul, King Saul, Barach min Asrara, he ran away from honor and from uh, control. When Hashem wanted to make him the king, Hashem said to Shmuel, the prophet, Shaul is hiding, he's putting himself down. Until today we use this expression of a shy person that hides on the side, that he doesn't want to make too much noise and control. It's called Nechba El HaKelim. And when they came to Shaul, Amar Laem, he said to them, go and ask Baurim Ubatumim of the board that the Kohen had on his chest, before you make me a king, go check if I'm worthy. Today, do you know any politician that you come and say, we decided that you, you're going to be the head of the Democratic Party, or the, the Republican, or the head of the Likud, or whatever, he's going to say, I'm not sure if I'm worthy. <laughs> What took you so long? <laughs> Usually it would be, what took you so long? Shaul say, go and check by the Urim of the Tumim if I'm worthy or not. And put me where I belong. If I'm worthy, yeah, fine. If not, don't put me there. Miyad, vayishalu be'ashem. They did it. Im ra'u yu im lav, kach shanu chachamim. En ha'kelim, ela Urim ve'tumim. Shaul barach min asrara, v'iratfa acharav. Shaul ran away from Aner, and the Aner chased him to get him. Shenemar, areitem asher bachar bo. It's written over there that Hashem chose Shaul, no matter how much he hid, and he said, go and check if I'm worthy. Hashem did not let go and made him the king. Avimelech ben Yerubal, aya rodef achar asrara. Was running after honor and control, and no matter what he tried to do, he cannot get it. The people of Shechem, Hashem instigate between him and 
ומשה רבנו, משה, was very humble, ran away from control. בשעה שאמר לו הקדוש ברוך הוא, ואתה לך יש ויש לך חיל פרעה, now I'm going to send you to פרעה, ויאמר בי אדוני, שנח נא ביד תשלח. It's friend with someone else, why with me? I don't deserve to go. And he started to give all kinds of excuses. I'm stuttering, my brother is older than me, they won't listen to me, all kinds of excuses. אמר רבי לוי, שבעה ימים פיתה הקדוש ברוך הוא את משה שילך בשליחותו. Seven days Hashem was begging משה to go. Seven days. Again and again and again. And he refused to Hashem. Hashem said, go save the Jewish nation. If you're not going to go, no one will save them. They're all going to get destroyed. And what does he say? I'm not going to offend my older brother. He said, Tzadik, he's 83, I'm 80. It's not fair. Or oh, I'm going to make an embarrassment to your reputation. I'm coming, I'm stuttering. I have speech problems. You want me not to speak? They're all going to make fun. This is what he's thinking. And Hashem answered to him, who gave you the mouth? Who gave a person a mouth? I'll put words in your mouth. Don't worry about it. שנאמר לו איש דברים אנוכי, גם מתמול, גם משלשום. You know, I'm not... I'm not a great in speech. I'm not a, such a great talker. He's running away. Someone else would say, Hashem, you promised me that you're going to protect me and you're going to put words in my mouth. Then of course I want to be the king. <laughs> but as long as you promise me. Okay. But he, Moshe said, no, no, it's not me. Send with him, send with him. It's like a swear. You, have, you, end, you will end ending that you have to go. That's what's going to be the end. You're going to go. He went to Paro. He said, Hashem said. He said, Paro, who is Hashem? He said, Moshe, what do I care? I already did what Hashem told me. Let me go and sit in the corner. He ran away. He didn't want to continue. <laughs> so he was running away from the job. In the end, he became the king. And he took them out of Egypt, and he made all the miracles, and until today is is known as the head and the greatest prophet ever lived. Then the Torah continued, Daber al Bnei Israel. Daber al Bnei Israel. Every mitzvah is always bringing Bnei Israel. Speak to Bnei Israel. Tzavet Bnei Israel. Why? To show you how Hashem liked them, constantly bringing their names non-stop. The only time Hashem did not say Bnei Israel was in a sin of the golden calf. Red Kishichet Amcha, go that your nation made a sin. But everywhere else, Bnei Israel, my nation, Am Israel, Bnei Israel, 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 constantly repeats it. Even God called himself, what's his stamp? The God of Israel. The Goim, they had a little bit brain, just and here, it's enough. The God of the world that we believe in, Christian, Muslim, how does he call himself? The God of Israel. <laughs> he didn't call himself the God of Syria, the God of Iraq, the God of China, the God of Obama. <laughs> if he would, that's a different story. If he would say, I'm the God of the world. Oh, everyone is equal. I'm the God of the Middle East. Oh, so all the Middle East is in the same level. I'm the God of the East. I'm the God of the West. Something like that. It's include many nations. Now once... Always, I am the, the God of Israel. 100%. We say Melech HaOlam. This is Chachamim. To make him the king of the whole world. Not only if you say, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Am Israel. That will be a disgrace. Well, I'm only the king of the, the nation of Am Israel. I'm not the king of the world. But Hashem called himself the God of Israel. Of course he's the God of the world. The God of everything, ma. But I want everyone to know that I dedicated my name to be specially for my children. So it's very interesting. Every mitzvah mentioning Bnei Israel that they are precious before Hashem. Like it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 19. Remember the source. Haben yakirli Ephraim im yelet shashuim. The Jewish nation to me is my most precious son. The son that you play with all the time. You know, you have this baby that everyone loves and play with and hug and give him candy and ice cream and playing with him. Hours! What about the other one? He's 14. Hi, how was your day? You have pizza in the microwave. 
one minute a day. <laughs> Six hours a day with this one-year-old baby. One minute a day, go find something. Okay, go to the store, buy yourself something. Just for that charitable. Oh, okay. That's one, one of the reasons. One of the reasons, but I, I'm surprised. It's one thing you're jealous with someone, but why would you act against them to defeat them, to destroy them when you know you're going against God, which you also believe in that God? Do you understand the idea here or no? A father said to his son, I know you're jealous with your oldest son, and I'm warning you, it's very important to me. Be careful not to bother him. So now, since he also loves his father, they both love the father, just for the father... He will never bother him. Not that he, he likes him. He jealous why he chose him and not me. But for the honor of his father, he should be quiet and never say a word, right? For his own good. Because it's like the father saying to him, if you mess with him, if you hurt him, you actually have business with me. It's very clear. Okay, so... But that's a lie because it's written many times that Hashem will never change his mind and he promised Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov that he will never replace their children with any other nation. It's written in the Torah clearly. It's a verse in the Torah. Do you know which verse? No, the Amidah it's Tfilah. In the Tanah, in the Torah. Do you know which verse? I'll tell you the verse. Af al pi, even though bi yotam be'eretz oivem when the Jews were scattered in the land of their enemies, lo me'astim ve'lo ge'altim lechalotam. I will not get so disgusted from them and so tired of them to destroy them. Lo me'astim ve'lo ge'altim lechalotam. What's the rest of that pasuk? In this pasuk, it says clearly that Hashem doesn't ever replace us with another nation. Even though I'm very disappointed from the way they behave, אף על פי ביותם בארץ אוהביהם לא מאסתים ולא גאלתים לחלותם להפר בריתי איתם, כי אני השם אלוהם. To annul my covenant with them. I will never do that. Why? Because I swore to Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov that I will never replace their children with any other nation. So it's a few times in the Torah. And also it says in the Torah, ביצחק יקרא לך זרע. He said to Avraham, your children as far as I concern are Yitzchak, not Ishmael. What do you mean? Ishmael also came from his seed. I don't care. Take your son, single, not plural. The one you love, your only son, Yitzchak. What about the other one? Who cares about him? It's clear me in the Torah. It's, you see, it's not what I think or what I want. I'm just reading two verses from the Torah. By the way, the Arabs read the same verses in a mosque. If they bring the Torah, they believe in the Torah. It's the same thing. What do you think? It's written over there, and Hashem said to Abraham, you have one son as far as I concern. That's it. What do you want more than that? Two billion Arabs, 13 million Jews, and Hashem said to Abraham, I don't care about all of them. I only care about your son, Yitzchak. Be Yitzchak, he care about Very clear. What is the explanation to your explanation? Who? I tell you what they say. They say that the Jews changed the Torah, that it was really Ishmael. They switched Ishmael and Yitzchak. Now I want you, the genius, the Russian genius, to tell me, please, why it's the dumbest thing a person ever say from the time the world was created until today. It cannot be dumber than that to say what they say. You tell me why it's the dumbest thing. No? No. They come and say the Jews replaced Yitzchak and Ishmael. It was really Ishmael in the Akedah. And what Hashem said, take Ishmael, not Yitzchak. The Jews changed it. Huh? What is it? Idel Peter? Idel Idel Adha. Idel Adha. 
Eid al-Mustafa. No? <laughs> no, no, why? It's the dumbest claim. You see, it's not enough just to be smart in chess. You have to be smart in Torah. The answer is, Rabotai, because the Jews were scattered all over the world. And they keep copying Torah and writing Torah non-stop in different parts of the world when there's no communication, no internet, no telephone, no television, no nothing, no FedEx, nothing. And the Jews are writing thousands of thousands of Sifre Torah manually all over the world. Jews in Hong Kong, Jews in Syria, Jews in Yemen, Jews in Russia. They're all writing 304,805 letters. One day, out of nowhere, 50,000 Jews that are writing Sifre Torah all over the world, they woke up and they all knew how to change the Torah. They switched Yitzhak and Ishmael. So question number one, is something like this possible? Of course not. Question number two, where are the old Sifre Torah? It should have been two versions all over the world, right? Now, once in the history, anybody found one copy of Torah that it said that it was Ishmael. Do you understand why it's the dumbest claim ever? That's what they're hanging to, to live in a lie. I tell you what, when you win the argument, it's very dangerous. When you win against a Christian priest, in the end people come, they clap, you shake hands, and you go. If you win against them, they don't say. They do. You understand? <laughs> Someone asked me, why you don't have a debate with uh, some Muslim scholar? I said, when I be 75, I'll do. <laughs> you got the point. <laughs> We didn't even start the lecture yet. <laughs> Go back to the text. Okay, now. I think we We always learn. We always learn. But well, I want to start the lecture. Aha. Let's make a deal. If you disturb us one more time, we're going to move his mustache to you. <laughs> huh? Would you go with a mustache next week? <laughs> so be quiet. Daber at Bnei Israel. Hashem is keep mentioning Bnei Israel in the Torah, even though it's clear to who Moshe speaks. But ten were called dear. When you speak to a person and you write to him, dear, then everybody that knows that you have special sympathy to that person. You like him, he helped you, he's your brother, is he someone you love. The word dear, you don't give it to your enemies or to just a stranger you just met a second ago. It belongs to someone you really like. Ten things were called dear in the holy books. Let's see. One, the Torah. Ten, Hashem called them dear. One, the Torah. Shenemar, yekarai mipninim. Precious, maybe dear is not the right word, precious. Yekaraim ipninim, it's written in Proverbs 3, verse 15. Yekaraim ipninim, the Torah is more precious than rubies, than jewels. Second, prophecy. Prophecy, where does it say that prophecy is precious? Udvar Hashem haya yakar bayamim ahem. And Hashem spoke to Shmuel, the prophet, and he told them certain things. It says that the Rav Hashem Haya precious in that day. The third thing, wisdom, Tvuna. Shenemar Yekar Ruach Ish Tvuna. Yekar Ruach, someone that is a clever spirit, the Torah called him Yekar. Fourth one, Da'at. That is the ability to take everything you learn and translate it to actions. Shenemar uchli akar sifte dat. Uchli akar sifte dat. Also, they use the word yakar. F- the fifth one, it says like this: Yakar mi chokma u mi kavod sichlut meat. When a person is very very smart, you don't want to look too perfect. Do a little bit 
things that make you not so perfect. Otherwise, everyone will come and destroy you. Show that you're human. If you're too perfect, people won't be able to take it. So they say over here, sikhlut, which means it's do something foolish here and there. It's also yakar. F- sixth one, osher. Welt. Welt. Sheneemar ve'on adam yakar charutz. A person that has a lot of wealth, it's also very precious. Why wealth is precious? Who can tell me why? Everything we understood, but why wealth? Why wealth is precious? Wealth destroyed the life of many people. Oh, very good, that you can buy billions and trillions of mitzvot with that. How can he not be good? A poor person wants to build yeshivot, wants to sponsor CD, wants to save widows, orphans, send children to yeshiva, taking them out of public school, helping sick people. He cannot do none of them. Someone who makes a lot of money, he can write a few million dollars here and there, checks here and there. He gained billions and billions of mitzvot. So of course, money is the most precious thing on earth, if you use it right. The fact that you don't use it right doesn't mean it's not precious. Even if you have rubies, each ruby is $10 million. And you have hundreds of them. And you play with that in the street. And you leave it in the sand. So, someone says, yeah, ruby is garbage, look. It's on the floor, in the, gar- in the mud. I know you fool. Ruby is precious. The person is stupid. Just because he threw the rubies away doesn't mean they're not, they're not valuable. So the seventh thing, the nation of Israel. Aben Yakir li Ephraim, as we say, Yakir. The eight one, kindness, chesed, mercy. Sheneemar, mayakar chasdecha, how precious is the kindness of Hashem. The sixth one, mitatam shel tzadikim. When the big tzadikim passed away from the world, it's something very precious in the eyes of Hashem. Why? Why? He takes them to heaven. No big deal. For Hashem, it makes a difference if they're in heaven or here. One way or the other, they're righteous. Not for, for him, for us. Because one of them that go can save 10,000 of us. Because it goes by the value of the person, not by quantity. It goes by quality. One big tzaddik, it says in Shira Shirim, Dodi Arad Legano Lilkot Shoshanim. Dodi it's Hashem in Shira Shirim, went down to his garden, meaning this world, to pick up the roses. There's millions of thorns. Here and there you find a rose. When you pick up a rose, obviously a rose wo- worth like maybe a million thorns. What's the value of the thorns? So the idea is that's a, a parable that Hashem pick up the roses, meaning the big, righteous, precious people, when he takes one, it's instead of thousands of thorns, the value of it, to give more time for the other people to make repentance. And the, ten, the tenth one, the righteous people. Where does it say that they are precious? Veli mayakru re'echa el ve'israel ne'emar ba'em yakar she'ne'emar la'yehudim ha'ita ora ve'simcha ve'sason ve'ikar so there are ten psukim that say the word yakar, precious or preciousness, and those are the, the, the ten words that connected to that expression. That says in the Torah, Vaikra, the book of Vaikra, we call it Torah Kohanim, the Torah of the Kohanim, the coins. Why they call it Kohanim? Because the entire book is only related to Kohanim. To Mishkan, to Bet HaMikdash, to the Kohanim, to the sacrifices, to all kinds of sins that people do. And they have to now repent in Bet HaMikdash by sacrificing all kinds of sacrifices. So the entire book, as I explained to you, is from Rosh Chodesh Nisan to Rosh Chodesh Iyar. And the second year of the Exodus of Egypt, 30 days, that's all. This is the time that Hashem taught Moshe Rabbeinu this book. One month, that's it. And everything in this book is done by the Kohanim. They are the servant of Hashem, the children of Aaron. And now we're going to learn some of the secrets of the sacrifices, which most people don't know, because it's not something that you hear about, it's so common. The Kohanim are the ones who sacrifice these sacrifices. What are these sacrifices? It's a general name 
to a single Jew that brings or the public that brings. Some sacrifices is brought by an individual and some by the public or by the entire nation. And it's for the sake of heaven into the temple. All the sacrifices, why they call it in Hebrew korbanot? Korban. Why korban? <coughs> Very good. It makes the person karov Hashem. Karov means closer. Close. It, once you sacrifice, it makes you closer to Hashem. How exactly taking a sheep that just cost me $300 in the market bringing him to Bet HaMikdash like this. Mr. Cohen, Rabbi Cohen, here, Fadal, Yalla, make for me. Well, I accidentally cut grass by mistake. I didn't, I didn't realize I wanted to pick up something. Oops, grass came out. I cut it from the roots by mistake on Shabbat. I want to sacrifice Korban Chatat. So he takes it, slather it, make, you know, burning it. How exactly it makes me close to Hashem. How? So every donation, why just sacrifice? Why they don't call donation sacrifice? It also make you closer to Hashem. You just gave a million dollars, they build a shul. and made you closer to Hashem. But it doesn't cause a korbanot, it doesn't call. Soon we'll understand why. I don't want to say it now, I'll say it in five, ten minutes. Just remember the question. How many mitzvot from 613 mitzvot we have in the book of Vaikra? Short book, short period of time in history, only one month. How many mitzvot are in this book? Who knows? From 613 mitzvot. Give a guess. You think more than 100 or less? More? Very nice. Less? You're out of the game. More than 200 or less than 200? More than 200. Very good. More than 250 or less? Less. I'll exaggerate. 500 from 613. 200, 234 mitzvot from Taryag mitzvot are in the book of Vaikra alone. Just in this book. In the Sefer Bereshit, that is 2,200 years of history. How many mitzvot came from Sefer Bereshit? Two. Huh? Two. Three. The whole book, three mitzvot. Why? There is really nothing to do yet. The Torah wasn't given yet. It's only Brit Milah, things like this. Avraham Avinu, Gida Nashe, uh, yes. So, you know, Mamash, three mitzvot over there. That's it. Nothing else. But here, since now we're getting into the, all the laws of Beta Mikdash and the Korbanot, 234 mitzvot. When the cloud covered the Oel Moed, what's Oel Moed? The tent. The cloud came down. On what date the cloud came down? Huh? Today. Today it's the day. Today was the day. Now it's already the second of Nisan. The cloud came down on the tent. Moshe was waiting outside to listen to the word of Hashem. Hashem called him and gave him permission to come inside. What do you see from here? Moshe Rabbeinu Baruch Hashem was not arrogant. He stood outside to see what Hashem tells him to do. He didn't go in. Stand outside waiting. After Moshe entered the tent, Hashem started to speak to him. When Hashem spoke to Moshe, was it loud or was it a low voice? What do you think? Loud? Then everybody else outside heard also. So it's not only to Moshe. Hundreds of other people heard. The answer, it was loud, but only Moshe heard. How do you do such miracle? You speak very loud to someone, 
and nobody else here. How? Headphones. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I made it up. No headphones. Hashem spoke in such a spiritual way that he went only to the one he chose. And he made no... By the way, today, some of the things the animals hear, we don't hear. You know that? If you have a dog or a cat, you know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, they jump, they look up, they go crazy. You don't see anything and you don't hear anything. But they get very paranoid. Also, they have a device. You buy it for 20 bucks. You plug it in your house. No more mosquitoes. No mosquitoes come, no butterflies, no bees, no nothing. Wonderful. Don't have to buy all the screens, each all day. What is it? What is it? They have a button over there, demo. When you press on the button for one second, it cuts your ear to two. It's so loud, you cannot even handle the whistle. It's so loud. Why they made this button? If, in case you want to know what the mosquitoes hear, press on this button. That's what they hear. But you don't hear anything. Silence. The frequency of the sound, it's designed according to different ears. The ear of the horse, the ear of the dog, the ear of the human being. It's very interesting. So now by pressing this button, you're changing the frequency. It, de it demonstrates what they hear. If you want to know why they're not coming near your house, that's the reason. Same thing, remote control for the postman. Postmen in America, they made them a special remote control. Every time they come to houses and there are dogs, if the dog comes to attack them, they press on the remote control and the dog faint. Did you ever wonder what the secret is? The dog postman come with all the letters. Ah! Be quiet. The dog falls like this. Why is it? It makes such noise, it sends now a message for about a minute or 30 seconds. It rips his ears, drives him crazy. Immediately he falls. <laughs> but we don't hear it. But it gets even better. When you cut a tree, if you take a person and you chop his hand, you take an axe, boom, you chop his hand. What are you going to hear? No. Screaming for an hour until he dies. Right? What kind of scream? Ah, ah, crying, screaming, running, jumping, until he faints. When you chop a tree, boom, 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 the tree screams or no? Yes. Huge screams. I don't hear anything. Why? The frequency of the screaming of the tree, it's programmed differently than your ear. Why? Because Hashem didn't want you to hear his screams. Because if you hear it, nobody would ever use trees, not for homes, not for furniture, not for anything. Without, Imagine life without trees. None of the houses and buildings that you have here you could build, because all the frame is wood. They make first all the frames with wood. Furniture you couldn't use. You couldn't heat houses. You could not make decks. Imagine life like this. All the frames, when they do cement, when they do the floors, they first make frames with wood also. And then they fill it up. It makes life impossible. If you, if you cannot use trees, our life will be miserable. So important. Also stones. But wood is not much important. So if we hear the screaming of the trees, we will never touch them. Who would have the heart to make the tree suffer so much? The Gemara said 2,000 years ago. Who knew about frequency of the ear 2,000 years ago? When you chop a tree, his voice goes from one side of the earth to the other side of the earth. That's how loud the voice is. But a person doesn't hear it. Trees, do they have relationship between them or no? What do you think? No, I didn't ask about Sikha. I ask relationship. Tree A fell in love with tree B. <laughs> Sends their messages, how much he loves her. The tree. You think it's possible or no? Yeah. Trees have feelings? 
yes. Trees talk, yes. So, no wonder the Torah says, Adam et sasadeh. Everything the person has, the tree has also. Same thing. You grow, the tree grows. You give fruits, meaning mitzvot, the tree gives mitzvot. You come from a drop of seed, he comes from a drop of seed. Unbelievable. If you take care of the tree when it's young, it will give you great fruits forever. If you take care of a baby when he's young, you put him in a good yeshiva, with good atmosphere, it will give you constant profit. If you does not take care of him, <laughs> you're going to become a criminal and destroy you. Same thing tree. You didn't take care of them in the beginning. That's it. It doesn't give fruits. I went to one place. I saw pomegranate tree. All the pomegranate. All rotten, black. Why? They don't care. It's in a shul. Nobody takes care of it. But you go in the nice houses. They come beautiful. You saw the ones that they have in Costco? Like the size of a watermelon almost. You know? When you open the pomegranate, I wonder to myself, why Hashem made the things inside be there? He couldn't make it sweet. Now, why? Now when you smash it, you have the machines, right? You want to make juice. When you smash the whole thing, the juice drip, it comes with some bitterness. Even if you buy those bottles, the pomegranate juice, when you drink it, you feel a little 5% bitterness. It wants a little bit of taste. If you wouldn't have this bitterness, it would be sweet like honey. This bitterness take away from the taste of the pomegranate. Why has she made it bitter? Did you ever think? Why? To protect it from the worms. They, they begin to, tie, to bite it. It tastes like poison. It's very bitter. Protect the fruit. Everything is calculated. When you cut the pomegranate to two and you want to take all the seeds out, why is it so complicated? You have to walk 10 minutes to have a, a, a little jar with some seeds. Why is it? Uh, what do you think? No? Why? Why? That's not so complicated. I'll teach you a trick. You cut it to two halves. You hold it upside down and you take a spoon. And you hit the spoon. And you, hit the, you hit it on the top. Tuck, tuck, tuck. They all fall. In a few seconds, everything falls down. You don't need with the hands. You hit it like this. I learned it from a Persian aunt of mine. Now, when I was in Israel, I saw in one minute she peeled three pomegranates and it's ready. So, how do you do it so quick? Come, I show you. All your life you suffer, in a minute you see how you live in mistake. It's like that uh, Russian scientist. No offense. Russian scientist, for months they had a committee thinking how to make a pen. That would work in space because you don't have gravity. So the ink will not go down. Why the ink goes down when you write? You have gravity. Everything is pulled down. No gravity. Nothing goes down. So how are you going to... The pen won't write. The ink will stay inside. So they Russians, they brought Gorbachev and Khorashov and everybody <laughs> and Vladimir. And they're all sitting, breaking their heads. The, the greatest brains of Russia. And then in the end, they had Sergei, the cleaning guy. <laughs> He's mapping the floor. He said, I don't understand. <laughs> Why don't you use pencils? <laughs> All these Russian genius ones, they looked at him. <laughs> ah, didn't we really think about it? The cleaning guy, $3 an hour. <laughs> and all these professors, and he knew better than them. <laughs> Tov. <laughs> if I prove to you that it happened in reality, what do you lose? <laughs> do you think I had a dream and it came to me in a dream or fairy tales that I'm sitting and making up stories? What do you think? No, I, I like the story. Very good. But I don't think it's a I promise you it did. It's in a science book. Would they make themselves look like fools and write fiction? I doubt it. You have to give a little benefits of the doubt even to the infidel scientist. But when they write something in a book, they don't plan to cheat and trick people. I'm not saying no, but you, you obviously don't know how 
You have a very good habit. Something you never read about and never heard did not exist. Does not exist. Did I say it doesn't exist? I said, where, where did you say this story from? Did he say it doesn't exist, the story? I, said, I don't no? think I said that. I don't think. I don't think. I think okay, I know for sure. Usually before you talk, you Google. Check. <laughs> then come back to me. We'll be back with you soon after commercials. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so now... <laughs> The voice was very loud, just like the voice in Mount Sinai when they got the Torah. But even though it was so loud, nobody heard it. Even Aaron and his sons that were standing nearby, they didn't hear anything. Only Moshe heard. Only Moshe heard. Now, if a person made a sin, he has a mitzvah to bring korban to repent for his sin. The sins of the people, you can divide them to three categories. Sins in the mind, sins with the mouth, and sins with the hand, meaning the body, hand, legs, whatever it is. There are three different channels of sins. Sometimes the sins is in all three channels. It's in the mind, it's in the mouth, and it's in with the hand. Sometimes it's only in the mind. You're thinking about something not modest. You saw something not kosher, and now you're closing your eyes and you're thinking about it. You didn't do anything with your hands, you didn't go anywhere, nothing. It's only in the mind. Here you go, seeing that it's only in the mind. Sometimes you speak to your friend about it. Now it became the mind and the mouth. And sometimes you actually go and make the actual sin later on. Now it became three. The mind... The mouth and the action. Let's see what's the differences on the repentance to each one of those three channels. So it says like this. The korban came, the sacrifice came to repent for all different, for all the three different channels. When a person holds the animal, the sheep, with his hands, this is for his hands, for the sins he made with his hands. When he makes confession... He say Khatati, Aviti, and all this confession. It repents from the sin that he made with his mouth. When the inside of the animal is getting burned, all the inside pieces of the body, that's for the mind, from the inside spirituality, that is the nefesh of the, of the person. That's where the thoughts are, the spirit. Everything is getting burned. A person has to think, this should have been my blood spilling here. And that should have been my body burning. And my inside was also supposed to be burning, my inside organs. That's how it wakes the person right away to do tshuva. Most of the time he will begin to cry, he will melt his heart. And that's what it means when it says that it makes a person close to Hashem. You feel very strong attachment now to Hashem. Wow, I don't know how to thank you. That should have been me. And I'm still alive. And that's mamash shaking up the person. What is it like? Sometimes you come to a lecture and the speakers say a very emotional story. And then you see some of the people, they cry in the audience. And that wakes them up so much to feel so close to Hashem. And you wonder to yourself, wow, where, where were you until now all these years? All of a sudden, five minute story, and they mamash like broke all the obstacles between them and Hashem. We'll get to it, one second. Rachame Kadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem has more mercy on you when you bring the sacrifice. And you waking up to do tshuva. That's one reason why Hashem made the law of sacrifices. The Rambam say, the Goim used to do all kinds of sacrifices to their idols. And the Jews, believe it or not, were jealous. So Hashem designed the Torah in such a way that the Jews will do similar things, but much, much more clever and with much more meaning. I'll give you an example. Sometimes there is an expression, you kill two birds or three birds with one stone. 
with one transaction, Hashem does few good things. For instance, you need to repent. So look how many things Hashem does by you bringing a sheep into the temple. First, you make tshuva, right? It's supposed to be me. Second, you give out your money. It's like tzedakah. You, you take $300, you buy the sheep. So you're giving out money. Money, it's life. It took you, I don't know, four days to make the $300. So you're actually giving life. So yeah, it's like you're getting killed for two, three days. The third thing, you, while you're doing it, you supply parnasah to the Kohanim, to the chosen of the chosen, which is the family of the Kohanim, the royal family. They serve in Beta Mikdash. They don't have time to go work. So while they serve in a holy work, by giving them all the meat and the leftover uh, pieces of, uh, of uh, leather that they, or the wool, all the things that come from the animal, they trade. They sell it, they make tefillin with that, all kinds of things like that. You can make a couch with that, you can make leather clothes with that. So that's the parnasa. Then, of course, other things, masrot, wheat, barley, all the other things you bring to Bet HaMikdash, baskets of fruit in, uh, in Chol HaMoed. All this is while I'm actually doing a mitzvah, at the same time I sponsor the Kohanim. So, now there is a secret in here. All these animals that are chosen, if you come, there's a hundred sheep, hundred, and they say to him, which one you want? I want this one. There's no coincidence. Why this one, not this one? Some of these animals have reincarnations of wicked people in them. Not all. Some animals have, some doesn't. When you say, I want this one, Mishamayim Hashem brings this one into your eyes. You choose him. You bring him into Bet HaMikdash. They slaughter him. They sacrifice him. This is a correction for a soul of a wicked person who died and was sent back to the world in reincarnation in animals which is very interesting. I have an aunt, Baruch Hashem, about 80 years old, Shetichyeh. They, they became religious 30 years ago. About maybe 28 years ago. Eren Neraz ben Mayankel, Alava Shalom, and almost the whole family, except one son, everybody became religious. They used to have a dog. In Israel, all the dogs got, for some reason, American names. Steve, Billy, Johnny, I don't know, kinds of names like this. So his name was Billy. Not Clinton, but Billy. <laughs> so, you know, every time you used to go to them, they used to live in Ramle. Ramle, it's not a religious city. There are some religious people there, but it's main, not mainly a religious city. Billy, Billy, Billy. Oh, my uncle Uri, Allah Shalom, used to take Billy outside. When they became religious, they moved to Yerushalayim. They lived in a Bukharian neighborhood, ultra, ultra orthodox, right across the street from Kafa Chaim Yeshiva, Or Atzafon. If you know Yerushalayim, Or Atzafon. The heart of the ultra orthodox people. That's their neighborhood. And my uncle, Alava Shalom, used to come out with his dog. If you have a dog in places like this, people think you're out of your mind. He goes out and everyone <laughs> looks at him. What is this? A Haredi Jew walk with a dog? They came to Rabbi Tzion, Abba Shaul, Alava Shalom. He was still alive. They said to him, what should we do? Oh, wait. Before they went to him, they gave the dog to their son who still lived in Ramle. Do you know how far Ramle from Yerushalayim is? Maybe 30 or 40 miles. They gave it to their son. After a few days, my aunt came home. Billy is sitting by the door. He came all the way from Ramlet to Yerushalayim, and he found the apartment. <coughs> and don't tell me it was because of smell. <laughs> Please, don't even try. Wait, soon you understand how he did it. Then you understand he was a mamash, a human being, this dog. My aunt saw like this. They went to Rabbi Tzion Abba Shaul Zatzad. He said to them, Ktsar ba'ale chayim, it's the oraita. You have, no cho- you have no choice. You got him when you are not religious. If you leave him now, he'll die. He'll break his heart. So you must take care of him until he dies. And the embarrassment that you have from the people here, all the Hasidim here, all the people that comes to pray in the neighborhood, 
It's kapara tavonot. It helps you to erase your sins. So why do you worry so much? My aunt swore to me, five days a year, Billy refused to eat. She puts the food in front of him. Five days a year. Yom Kippur, Tisha Be'av, Tzom Gdalia, Asara Betevet, and the Tzomot, 17 Betamuz, he refused to eat. Billy eat. Maybe Tanit Esther also. He refused to eat. She said to me, do you believe it? I already know. Fast day, I always try. Eat, eat. Doesn't eat all day. He'll go over a person. People come back in reincarnation. Rav Nisim Yagen, Alav HaShalom, he passed away about 15 years ago. He was a very strong speaker. He came one time to New Jersey. He was in America. They told him someone just died in an accident. 20, 21 years old boy from a rich family in New Jersey. They sit in Shiva. May the Rav come and give a strong speech there for everyone is broken there. Okay, he went there. He gave them a speech. And the people eating after the speech. They hear by the door scratching, you know, like this by the door, you know, like nails. They open the door, a huge dog standing by the door. Huge, scary dog, look like a wolf. Everybody started to scream, wow. Cried away, they closed the door. Then again. And the rabbi say, open, open the door. He's clever. Dog doesn't show up at night, 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. in New Jersey in a nice, beautiful mansion, standing by the door when everyone sits Shiva and try to walk in. No barking, no going crazy, nothing. Like this, like a nebech. Open the door. They open the door, he walked. He went and sat right on a couch. There was one single couch. He was brave enough and not politically correct. <laughs> and he said to them, this is your son came back. There's no wonder he came here. And, and the mother started to scream, this is where my son liked this couch. He was sitting on it all the time. The old Shiva did not leave. There is, there was... Two very big rabbis in Monsi, Schwab, the Schwab brothers. Everybody knows them in America. They're the biggest rabbis in America, among the top ten that ever lived here. Two brothers, Mordechai Menachem Schwab and Shimon Schwab. Very big chachamim, they lived in Monsi. One of them, Rav Mordechai Menachem Schwab, he was going to the shiva, of course, every day. One day a cat showed up, waiting by his door. He walks out, the cat walks with him. He walks to the yeshiva, the cat walks next to him. He comes, the cat sits sit by the, by the daughter of the yeshiva. He's there for hours. He comes out to go home, the cat follows him. Everywhere he goes, the cat walks with him. One week like this. Everybody in Monsi said, there's a cat attached to the leg of Rav Mordechai Menachem Shuav Zatzal. The cat doesn't want to go anywhere. Doesn't leave him alone. Everywhere he goes, he's waiting there over there. After a week, he came to the yeshiva. He said to the cat, I know what you need. We're going to do it for you now, but please, after that, you leave me. He got into the yeshiva. He said, everyone, stop one second. We're going to say Kaddish for the soul of the person is reincarnated in this cat. And uh, one person got up. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia Omer, Zakot Israel. Everybody got up and they started to say Kaddish. Listen carefully. Everyone in Monsi of that time, they all witnessed that story. Hundreds of people. As they finished the Kaddish, the cat turned around, came to cross the street to the other side. A car came, shh, killed them on the spot. Five seconds after the Kaddish finished, the cat died. Tikkun. Finish this tikkun. That's what he needed, this Kaddish for his soul. It's crazy. But it's reality. What can you do? The fact that 90% of the Jews or the non-Jews in the world do not even know there's such thing, reincarnation in raw material and in animals, that they change reality? <laughs> they can live in the darkness for the rest of their life. But that's reality. It's no joke. And most of the hardest reincarnations are in animals, Guess to who? Dogs is one of the worst ones. Who, who comes back in this kind of animals? Maybe better not to say. 
if you don't want hand like headlines tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Gemara say a dangerous dog is not allowed to raise in a house. Dogs that are no danger, it's allowed but not recommended. Why dog? Because dog from two million different kinds of animal is the worst animal out of all of them. It's the most filthy animal in a spiritual aspect, not physical. It can be very nice, clean dog with fair, very clean. They give him twice a day showers, 100%, cleaner than people. That's not what we're talking here about, about his body, if he's clean or not, or if he's cute with his beautiful blue eyes. We're talking about the nefesh of the dog. The nefesh of the dog is the most impure nefesh from all the animals. Even worse than Chazir. Why is it? Why is it? So when Hashem sends a person to be reincarnated in dogs, that means he take a Jewish soul, which is the purest thing on the creation, and attach it to the nefesh of the dog, which is the filthiest thing in the creation. And just imagine the torture. That you take the purest, to the walls and attach them together for five years, ten years, twenty years, that this dog will be alive. It's a nightmare for the soul. It's worse than Gehenom, worse than hell. Imagine hell. Hell is worse than Auschwitz. And this suffering is worse than hell. So just imagine how horrible it is for the people. It's not that the dog is cold now on the street and people curse and kick him and he's starving for two days, that that's the punishment. No! Even if it's the, the dog of the king of England or the queen of England and having the best life you can imagine, eating steaks for breakfast and having massage and go to the amusement park and go on trips and have a swimming lesson. <laughs> and even bar, mik, bar mitzvah they made to him. They got him tefillin, the reformed Jews. He looks very happy, the dog. The dog himself is happy. Who suffered? The soul that is reincarnated in him. The dog, the dog enjoys, runs after balls. It's all dogs with dogs that have a person reincarnated in them. And dogs who doesn't have, have the same pleasure from life. The dog. But the soul is suffering from the connection. The connection is horrible. There is different kinds of punishment. There's also kafakela. Ve'et nefesh harasha ikla'ena bekafakela. It's a horrible thing. It's like the slingshot. Making him fly with no rest from one side of the world to the other and horrible angels eating him up with the uh, with, uh, whips of fire. We don't understand what it means. Believe me, if people would know the price of the sins, most likely now one person will make one sin a year. Today it's all easy. Everyone say whatever they want. Everyone do whatever they want. Everyone say, you know, think whatever they want. They don't know the consequences. They don't know the consequences. Okay, let's move on. So the sacrifice is also hidden charity to the Kohanim. If you come to the Kohanim, I know you poor Mr. Cohen. Here is $1,000. He gets embarrassed. But if you come to repent for your sins, because it's written in the Torah, and you bring a sacrifice, and some of it is going to eat, and he's going to use some of it to make some parnasah, he doesn't get embarrassed. Because it's not that I did it for you. I did it for myself. I have to do it to, to repent. So he benefits indirectly from my need to repent. Also, when a person loses money, it hurts. Why people now drive very slow in compared to 10 years ago? They triple the fines. Everything, two points, four points, 400, 300, 500, and the policeman with his cruel heart give you five tickets, not one. He makes it $1,000. Then you need a lawyer, this, $2,000 just to get your license back. In Israel, cameras everywhere. Everyone became a turtle. <laughs> Why? One person told me, I, I drove one hour, I got three tickets. Three cameras on, on one road, on one highway. One, two, and three. I have to pay all three now. 
People are afraid. It hurts. Money hurts. Do you understand? By the way, Chazonish say, when you give charity, don't give an amount that doesn't even tickle you. That's almost nothing. You must give an amount that will hurt in your heart. Whoa, so much. It wasn't easy to make it. It has to hurt. That's the sacrifice when you give charity. If you make a $5 million a year and you give $3,000 to someone, it's a joke. It's a joke. What is this? I give you $5 million a year, you give me $3,000 charity? Ah, thank you very much. So generous of you. If you make 20000 a year and you give 3000 that's a huge sacrifice. Huge. But if you make millions and you give 3000 it counts almost nothing. Now you may tell me, but some people are so stingy, even if they give $10, they don't sleep at night. Like that lady from my story. Remember her? Can I give 54 Okay, it will be 36 In the end, 18 And until today, she doesn't sleep. <laughs> Right. And she lives in a $5 million home. It's not that oh, poor girl, she's unemployed for five years. So the idea is, you may come and say, it doesn't matter, he may have $100 million and he gives $10 and it bothers him very much, it hurts. So does it count or no? Yes and no. Yes and no. Why? Reality-wise, what can you do with $10? How many mitzvot you can do with that? Even 10 CDs is barely sponsored. So the amount of, uh, of uh, achievement is very, very limited. But as far as the effort, because this person is sick mentally, that's a huge sacrifice. Yeah? So they say, how a stingy person would overcome this mental disease? Stinginess is a mental disease. The answer is, he begins to give every every person that comes a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. A quarter he don't feel. Even if he's very stingy, what's quarter? But it adds up, another quarter. Then when you got used to give quarters, now you move to 50 cents. You give 50 cents. It hurts a little bit, you get used to it. Then you move to a dollar. You give a dollar, dollar, dollar. Then you, you got used to it, now you try to give three, four, five dollars. Constantly you increase the amount. So every time you increase it, you have a little bit more pain. You can tolerate it. Until you get to thousands and who knows to how much. That's it. Now, a a rich person that only committed a sin in his mind, which sacrifice comes for sins that we make with our minds. Korban oila. Like, especially for the sins that a person makes with his mind. Hirure alev, for the thoughts. And, and a rich person that did something like that, he comes to Bet HaMikdash and he brings two doves, birds. The Kohen ref, refused to take it from him. He got very upset. He said to his family, what is this? I bring two birds and the coin refused to take it from me. So his family told him, very good that they did not take it from you. It wouldn't help you anything. This is for the poor people, Hashem said, to bring birds. How much a bird cost? Five dollars each. Cheap, they cannot afford three hundred dollars. So Hashem had mercy on the poor. He gave them a huge discount. Bring only birds. But you, a rich guy, why do you bring birds you, you can bring 500 goats why are you bringing birds it won't help you anyway you understand you're a rich man so the rich man said if for a thought i have to bring a whole animal big animal hundreds of dollars just from one thought that i had what would be the price of actually committing the sins in reality, not only in the mind? From now on, he become very careful. When you pay, you stop. As long as you don't pay, you continue to celebrate. When, it, when the fine comes home, you learn your lesson. One more thing of the sacrifices that Hashem achieved, 
is when a person see how the animal is slaughtered and get burned and become ashes, it reminds him that soon it's going to be us. Where are we going to end? We're also going to end in a sand. And he realized that life here is temporary. It's all an illusion. It's all an illusion. A person come to the world, the only thing he can take with him is it good deeds and good mitzvot. One more thing, it warned the Jewish people to stay away from idol worshipping. Why? What is the connection of sacrifice and idol worshipping? Who knows? What was the gods of Egypt? The sheep. They bow down to those, to those animals. When we now come and burn them, it shows in our eyes they have no value. The Egyptians are foolish enough. They treated them like the holy, or like the Indians in India, worshipping the cow. But we burn it. It doesn't have some, so much of a value. Definitely it's not divine. So immediately it makes the idol worshipping disgusting in our eyes. What is this? We burn it, it becomes sand and, and ashes, and they worship these animals. Who is allowed to sacrifice those sacrifices according to the Torah? Can any Jew do it? A man, woman, converts, young, old, or only Kohanim? The answer, only Kohen. No one besides the Kohen is allowed to sacrifice. It's only gifted to Aaron and his sons and all their grandchildren until today. We don't have Bet HaMikdash, but even when we have Bet HaMikdash today, it's still only Kohanim. Someone that is not from the family of the Kohanim is not allowed to service and sacrifice in Bet HaMikdash. If he did, does it count or no? Maybe he made a sin, he did. Does it count for the person that brought the animal or no? Mr. Horvitz decided to be a Kohen today. He comes, he puts his outfit, yalla, bring. He does the service. Then he said to him, you Kohen, right? No, not a Kohen. So what are you doing here? I snuck in. Count or no? Sula, it doesn't count anything. So what other people can do? They can do shechita. They can do the slaughtering before the actual sacrifice. They can take off the skin. They can cut it to pieces. They can bring wood into the altar to light the fire or the candles outside. You know, they prepare everything outside Bet HaMikdash. So they can help with maintenance and all kinds of things around. But the actual sacrificing, only Kohanim. Someone that is drunk, he got a nice bottle of whiskey for Shabbat, <coughs> finish it, now he comes on Sunday to service, and he's in a good mood, you know, left and right, left and right, and he wants to sacrifice. Coin, allowed or not allowed? No. Not allowed. How much wine you have to drink to make you unable to work today? Revi'it. How much is Revi'it? 86 gram. In case you didn't get it. From here? No, it's not cost. Cost is more than Chazonish. Huh? Ah, Gimatria cost. How much is Revi'it? 86 grams, half of this cup. Half, that's it. One, you fill up your mouth. Your whole mouth is full with wine. And you swallow in one shot. That's enough already to make you a little bit out of shape. You may come and say, come on, Rabbi, I drink 10 bottles of beer. It doesn't even move me. Half a shivas I finish. I still walk straight when the car pull me over. What's for me a little wine? It doesn't go by each individual. What are you going to do? Start checking each individual how much tolerance he has for alcohol? You have to make the minimum amount that can affect someone. That's the minimum amount. More than that, we don't take risks. 
Why the, by the way, you should know that the wine in the old days was very, very strong. It wasn't like today, 12%, 9%, 7%, 5%. No. It came with the pieces, with all the pieces of the grapes in the bottom of the barrel. They used to mix it. They give you now wine. It's very thick. It's about 50% alcohol. You drink it like this, you're already in a different world. By the time you wake up, the, the, the sacrifice will be already ashes. <laughs> what happened? Where am I? What day it is today? Huh? They, yeah, if, they don't, if they mix it with water, it's a different story. Yes, because otherwise you cannot function. What are you going to do? Meziga, right. Over here, by the way, when they say Kohen Shishata Revi'it lo mazuk beyain, beyain, slicha. Meaning if it was mixed with water, with a lot of water, it's not so bad. Because the water makes it not as hard. You know, when we say Kadi, when we say Kiddush, we hold the cup of wine, we say Savri Maranan, everybody answer the Chaim. What is this? What's this? What's this? What are you talking to the world? What's the connection now, the Chaim? You hold it. Now even the Goim knows the Chaim, what it is. What is this l'chaim? L'chaim means to life. But why do we, when we hold the cup of wine on Shabbat, the person that makes kidu say savri maranan and everybody answer l'chaim? Do you know where it comes from? The answer, when they used to execute people in a Sanhedrin, in a Beddin, so they, the witnesses came and they say that uh, they saw him in Shabbat, and that Shabbat, at that time, and that's what he did. And they testify, and the testimonies are 100% match. Now they found him guilty. So they say in the bed, din, Savri Maranan, what's the decision of the rabbis? And the announcer say, Lamavet, to death. So immediately he was holding a cup of wine. Say, Savri Maranan, they answer to him, Lamavet. He had to drink it. Why? Because they don't want him to feel now the suffering. Once he drinks it, it's already, it's like anesthesia. And they take him to the place and execute him. But he doesn't feel it the way without it. We, however, on the other hand, we use the wine, not chaz v'shalom, to be executed. To the opposite. The Torah says, Those are the mitzvot that a person will do it in order for him to live thanks to them. Living meaning life of eternity, not only in this world. Also in this world, you're not allowed to die except three mitzvot. But all the other mitzvot, you're not allowed to die for it. Three separate mitzvot, yes. But the rest of the mitzvot, if you have to violate it to live, you live. You don't, uh, you don't give your life. So what do you see over here? We say l'chaim because we, Baruch Hashem, do kiddush now. Avdala, all this is mitzvot. Brit Mila, all these things. Now let's see, what are you sacrificing? Mitzvat me'atora to bring a complete sacrifice, complete animal that doesn't have any missing organ, doesn't have any broken bones, doesn't miss an ear or an eye or the lips is cut or all kinds of things like that. When you sacrifice a defected animal, you're violating two sins from the Torah. One is that the Torah said that you're not allowed, it's a disgrace to bring something incomplete like this to Hashem. And the second one is that they have an obligation to bring something perfect. So it's actually two violations, one positive and one negative. What other things make the sacrifice not kosher? When it's not from the best animals, you find a skinny dead one already. Anyway, it's going to die tomorrow. Well, I'm going to lose now 300 bucks on a fat, juicy uh, sheep now. Yalla, let's give the, 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 the cripple one. It's already one leg in Olam Abba, you know? And no mina mufchar. Hashem said, oh yeah? Like Cain. Just went and cut linen. Evel brought the best wool. Hashem took it. Cain brought just linen. He didn't choose the best. Hashem said, get out of here. You understand? So, it has to be mivchar nidrechem, from the chosen, the best ones. 
if he has a missing internal part, mechusar evar, pnimi, even if it's internal, from the outside it's complete, perfect. But inside you found later that he's missing something. It makes it trefa. Trefa means it's not kosher to eat. It's not kosher to eat. It's not kosher to sacrifice. An animal that the goyim bow down to. Imagine now you saw Maharaji from India. He bowed down to a sheep and left. What is the sheep fault that somebody is so stupid? <laughs> now you want to take this sheep and sacrifice it in Bet HaMikdash? Not allowed. If the goyim sacrificed an animal to their idol, meaning they gave it as a gift, as a, some kind of a monk feeding in their temple, and they gave him a, go, a sheep, and he doesn't know what to do with them. He has hundreds of them. Rabbi, I have too many animals here. Can you want, you want to come buy some of them? And he bought them from him, and now they want to sacrifice it. Not allowed. It was a gift to an idol. Mukze, avodat kochavim. Or they made him a god, like I said. Animal that killed another person. Animal killed another person. You're not allowed to sacrifice such a murderer. Did you see the film that the sheep was running after this woman? <laughs> and then the man came. <laughs> That's probably a, a killer, this one. I never saw in my life such thing. A sheep became an ox. Run after people, knocking them down, kicking them. No matter how many times the Spanish guy was kicking it, it, it doesn't give up. So it was unbelievable. Now, animal that is not at least seven full days old. It has to be at least seven full days old. From the eighth day and on, you are allowed to sacrifice it. By the way, you can see from all these, excuse my language, strange laws that it can never be a man-made laws. What man would make such laws? <laughs> what do I care? Do you take animal, you burn it somewhere in Yerushalayim? What does it help me? Why would I write a fake book and make 234 strange laws in a book of Vaikra? How to sacrifice, what to do, what not to do, how old the sheep has to be, if it's six days or eight days old. Who cares about these things? And if it's missing a little piece from the stomach or if it's missing a kidney. Why do I care about this? Why does it give me? Money will I get? No. People would like me better? No. They will hate me more. It doesn't make sense to anyone. Nobody wants to follow my book. Why would I do such a thing? You want to be a faker? Write a book that everyone likes. Only 1% donation a year, not 10. Right away, they're happy. Eat whatever you like. They're very happy. Once a year, you make a meal. They're very happy. Respect a little bit your parents. No, we can live with that. Don't kill, don't steal. No, pray once a day, two minutes. That's it. Great religion. Respect me, kiss my hand. I'm your king. When I die, remember that I was the prophet. And then the end of the story. Everyone bowed down to me. That's it. Why do I need to bring such a complicated book, so many things, to teach them so much, to make myself so much of work, and to write inside the book that I'm stuttering and I got punished and I did not enter the Holy Land because I was a sinner. That everyone in history will remember that I kind of fail in my mission about myself. Who would do such things? If you're clever enough, here you go, that's enough. You don't need more proofs, this, that, fish, scales. This is enough. No one will ever fake such a book. So now we continue. So it has to be at least seven full days old. What happens if it's a chicken? Korban abamina of a bird that flies. If it has a defect in it, it's still kosher. But if it has, it has a missing organ, then it's not kosher. If real an organ miss, it's not kosher. But he has a little cut here, a little there, a scar, something is not 100% straight, 
As long as it doesn't have missing organs, it's still kosher. When there's mitzvah to sacrifice something that deserves to be sacrificed, the Torah also say wheat, seor, and honey is not allowed. Why? If you put it on the altar, it makes it not kosher. You're not allowed to use not seor and not honey, not dvash. One more thing, the meat of the korban chatat, that the person accidentally made a sin, that if it would be intentional, it's death penalty, karet, I should say. For instance, breaking Shabbat accidentally, if it would be intentionally, it would be death penalty. Since it was unintentional, now the replacement for the death penalty is bringing korban chatat. When you bring korban chatat and also korban asham, you need to burn them. Or an animal that you did not say that it's Hekdesh. You Makdish this. It's not Ukdesha le Korban. The power of speech. You need to say this is a sacrifice for, Be- for Beta Mikdash. If you don't say it, then it's not ready for it's not uh, it's not what it cannot be a sacrifice. When do you sacrifice? When is the time to do it? As long as the doors of Beta Mikdash are closed, if you sacrifice, it's not it's not allowed. It has to be the doors has to be open. The first sacrifice has to be in the morning, in dawn, after you begin to see the sun on the east. That's the first daily sacrifice that we call it Korban Atamid of the morning, and then we have another one before it becomes dark. Korban Atamid of Ben Arbaim. Today we don't have Bet Amikdash, so we have Tfilat Shacharit, we pray in the morning instead of the sacrifice of the morning. And then we pray Mincha before it gets dark instead of the sacrifice of Atamid that used to be before the sunset. Later they added Tfilat Arvit. In the beginning it was no Arvit, only Shacharit and Mincha. After that, in the beginning they say Arvit is permissible, meaning you like to pray, pray. You don't like to pray, as long as you say Shema Israel, which is an obligation from the Torah. Later it became already a rule. That's it. Everyone does it. And for 2,000 years, everyone does it. But this is the replacement of the sacrifices. The Gemara say the world is standing on three poles. Three poles. Holding the entire life. What are they? A Torah, a Avoda, the Gmilut Hasadim. Torah, learning Torah, supporting Torah, everything that involved with Torah, that's one pole. Avodah, what's Avodah means? What's Avodah? He works in 7-Eleven making coffee. So the world is standing on that? Avodat HaKodesh, sacrifices of Bet HaMikdash or the Mishkan. Avoda, Avoda ta korbanot, like the Avoda that we pray in Musaf of Yom Kippur, it's a very long two hours Musaf back and forth, describe all the Avoda of the Kohanim and all that, that's called Avoda. And Gmilut Hasadim, kindness, helping, tzedakah, helping with your body, helping with your car, giving rides, helping the poor, helping the widows, helping children, teaching people, Visiting the sick. A lot of act of chesed we have in life. What's the biggest chesed you can do in your entire life? Who knows what it is? Yeah? Well, obviously chesed is helping someone. Huh? Well, uh, let me hear it. What? All chesed has to be helping someone physically. If you give your money, then it becomes charity, which is also falling in a category of chesed. Every charity is also an act of chesed. Oh, see, our hacham over here, Baruch Hashem, he knows when to show up, just when I need him. Making balei tshuva is the biggest chesed you can do on earth, ever. Meaning, if you donate money for CDs or take CDs and giving it to people, like this woman, and now she goes to Israel, so she couldn't come tonight. The older woman that comes here, remember her last week? She sits in the first floor, excited all day. She listened to lectures. 
So she takes in her age, it's not easy for her to walk, she has problems with her legs, she goes all the time here in Brooklyn and giving out CDs, putting here, putting there, and already made a lot of people become religious. Like our friend Shem Tov here, he comes with a bike, with a bag, he has the, the holy bag, he fills it up all the, every week with hundreds of CDs, he goes around, he gives the CDs, saves souls. That's one way. Another way, if you don't have time to pick up CDs and run to people and beg them to take, sponsor with money. So the money, we make CDs and we give them out and we ship them all over the world and people become religious. That's the biggest chesed you can do. What's more important? You give a person a meal when he was hungry or you save his soul and now he has life of eternity when he died? You compare a meal to life of eternity? Let's say he didn't have a car, so now you got him a car, so now his life is more comfortable. How long? Ten years, until the car died. So you give him ten years of convenience, which is fantastic. You compare this to life of eternity? No matter what you're going to try to compare, it's a joke. You gave them now life of eternity by showing him the truth, and he becomes Shomer Shabbat. Now he has a share to the world to come, which yesterday he didn't. He would suffer for eternity, and now he will enjoy for eternity. No, find me a better chesed than this. It's a great investment also. Because you benefit, by the way, no matter how much you help him, you help yourself much better than him. Because whatever he gets, you get more than him. Like the Gemara say, Gadol Abmeaseh Yoter Minaose. There's a fantastic rule in life. Mamash, a gift. Great. We, we have to kiss Hashem billions of times a day just for that. That he gave us such a bonus. What is it? You make other people do. They do and they get full reward and you get more than them. Did you ever see such thing that the broker make more than the owner of the building? An owner of the building has a building in Manhattan. $500 million it's worth. He comes to a broker. 25 years old. He said to him, help me to sell the building. So, okay, run around, puts ads, found a client. The client come, pay $500 million. Technically, how much the broker make? Between 2 and 4%. That's really the fees. Imagine there would be rule in America, the broker make more than $500 million. The owner of the building, after he killed himself to build it and all that, he makes 500 million and the government sent the broker a check, 550 million. People will go crazy. Well, how can it be such thing? Can it be? Here you go. The Torah say, you make him put fill in, he will get the reward, you're going to get more than him. You make him Shomer Shabbat, he's going to keep Shabbat, I'll give you bigger reward than him. You make him do all these other mitzvot, whatever he does, I'll give him his full reward. Nothing comes from his reward. And I will give you more than him. So <laughs> I always tell poor people, they tell me, believe me, if I was rich, I would give millions for tzedakah, for CDs. I say, you don't need to be rich. Convince your rich uncle to give. Convince your rich friend. Convince someone that, can, that you know that gives and he can give. You convince him to give. Whatever he gives, you're going to get more than him. And he sweat very much to make that money. And you're going to make more than him. Why? By telling him this is a good investment for you. Why Hashem made it like that? To encourage us to start helping each other to become righteous. There's no other way. It's a great incentive. Make him Shomer Shabbat. You're going to get even more than him. It's worth it for you. It's like saving yourself. Nothing you ever done for anyone. Everything you do for others, you do for yourself. Whether you're Jewish, whether you're not Jewish, you do for others, you do for yourself. A proof in the Gemara. Dama ben Natina was a goy. They had a jewelry store. They came from Bet Mikdash to buy a stone that fell from the 12 stones that the Kohen had. One, Yashfe, fell. Shevet Binyamin. The tribe of Binyamin, Benjamin, fell. Now they're looking for it all over. They say, this goy, Dama ben Natina, he has it. They went to him, how much? He gave him a price. Then he said, I cannot sell it to you. He went to, to get the, the stone from the box. His father was sleeping on the box. They didn't want to wake him up. So he say, they said to him, no, I understand. Okay, we'll give you extra. 
10%. No, extra 20%. No, 50%. Uh, double, triple, 10 times more. Ooh, ah, they came to such a price. No, no, I can't. They don't let him talk. They're so nervous. They need this stone. The next day, they came with uh, more. They said to him, listen. He said, no, no, the same original price I told you yesterday. Now you can have it. So, oh, well, we came up 100 times more. Why are you giving us now it's for the original price? Why, they, why yesterday they didn't give it to us? So I went to check. My father was sleeping on a bus, on a box. I didn't want to wake him up. The Gemara said he had a miracle. That night, he had a red cow was born. In his cattle, red cow, it's worth billions. He became a very, very rich goy. What do you see from here? The goy was honest with the Jews, and Hashem paid him billion dollars that night, cash. For what? For not taking advantage on their naive business conduct, conduction, whatever, conducting business. They were very naive. First, hear what he has to say. Ah, double, triple, ten times, fifty times. That's not a good customer. But they were so nervous, they must get it. In the end, he sold it to them for the original price, meaning he was a very honest person. And also, he respect his father. Respect his father. If it would be a clever Jew, do you think he would wake up his father or not? If he wouldn't wake up his father, he would be dead the next day. <laughs> his father is telling you, crazy? You didn't wake me up and we lost the customer for a million dollars? That's respecting the father. I never understood this Gemara, to be honest with you. How the guy was, what was in his mind? Okay, you respect your father. First of all, it's not an obligation from the seven laws of Noah. It's a nice thing to do. It's a decent thing to do. Of course, the Goyim has to respect their parents, but it's not in their Ten Commandments, which happen to be Seven Commandments. And he went so far, willing to lose such a customer. But, you see, that's what happened. The second part of it, said, I mean, said by love and Absur, Rashi said, because he spoke before his father, it's called the Rasha. That's why it is an obligation for the Goyim. Right, but it's not in a Seven. All the laws that require by common sense, the goyim are obligated. We know that. But it's not a part of the seven laws. Lavan yeah, spoke in front of his father, the Tuel, and it's called Rasha because his fa- he, he spoke in f- before his father spoke. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Mamash, I just want to finish these laws at least once in our life. We understand what it is. Now, the final korban is korban atamit shel ben arbaim. It seals the sacrifices of that day. So they do it as late as possible to allow as many sacrifices every day. If they do it very early, then people come and say, we're not allowed to sacrifice after korban atamit shel ben arbaim. People get very upset. So mamash, they wait until the last minute before it gets dark. They do it and finish Then what they do, all the sacrifices are done only in a day. When they throw the blood, it has to be done close to the time when they slaughter the animal, not very much later on. And also it has to be done in the day of the slaughtering. It cannot be in another day. If the sun went down before they threw the blood, right, they cannot throw the blood anymore. They mean they have to finish everything by the sunset. They sacrifice the, in, the, uh, the inside organs of the animal. They can do it all night. But, you know, the Chachamim, to make a person not wait until the last minute, they say do it until midnight. But it's better to do it during the day. On Shabbat, you also sacrifice sacrifices. Emure korbanot Shabbat, you do not wait for Motzei Shabbat. You can say, okay, we have time. We can do it all night, right? Why to do it on Shabbat? You do it on Shabbat. Even though it's kosher to do it at night, it doesn't matter that it's Shabbat. It's a holy thing. It's permitted inside Bet HaMikdash, even on Shabbat. Bet HaMikdash was a world of itself. The rules that apply in the rest of the world are different inside Bet HaMikdash. Some of the laws that outside is not allowed, inside Bet HaMikdash is allowed. The time of the Mincha, of the sacrifice, 
you prepare it in a day and you there is a levona and mincha all these things that comes attached to the sacrifice you do everything in a day but you're allowed to sacrifice it in the end of the day when the sun came down already and they go and they get burned on the Mizbeach all night long. There are different kinds of sacrifices. Some of them called Zvachim. They, you divide it to two categories. Some sacrifices, they have a light holiness. They call Kodashim Kalim. Some of them have severe holiness. It's called Kodshei Kodashim. Which sacrifices fall in the light holiness section? Shalmei Yachid, Toda, Korban Toda. Korban Bechor, Maser, Behema, and Pesach. Those are the light holiness korbanot. Which one are Kodesh Kodashim, Ola, Chatat, Chatat Pnimit, Chatat Chitzonit, Asham, Veshalmet Tzibur? If I want to explain to you every sacrifice now, we will finish tomorrow morning. But as long as you know that, it's better than nothing. Kadashim Kalim, you bring it, you can bring it by a single person. Kadshe Kodashim, a single person bring it, and also the public can bring it, like Shalmet Sibur. The public brings it. Right? The Shalmet Sibur can be brought only by the public, not by an individual. Korban Asham cannot be brought by the public, only by an individual. The Ola, the Shlamim, the Toda, they are uh, like a donation. But Chatat, Asham, Bechor, Maaser, Behema, Pesach, those are obligations. There's a difference between donation and obligation. Let me give you an example. Person, a man has to pray three times a day. What happens if he pray Mincha at 2 p.m.? And now his father say to him, let's go pray Mincha and Arvi together. He said to him, I pray Mincha already. He said, okay, no, come with me already, you do Arvit. Now he has to sit in a shul 20 minutes. When they pray Mincha, he already pray Mincha. Can he pray Mincha again? Why not? He can say, Areze Nedava. I'm going to pray now. Not, it's not an obligation. I fulfill my obligation for today. I want to donate. It's like bringing another sacrifice to Hashem. Why not? He can say, this is Nedava. And he prays again. If a person will be all day praying, better than being on the streets. Who knows what he does over there? I asked a bunch of rabbis this question, and they told me only if there's something new that came up, that they would read through it. Unless that's the case, it's not allowed to pray another prayer. You make chidush in a You say something new in it. Like, for instance, you add something that you did not add any other one. Yes. Yes. But you make chidush in a tefillah. You, do some, you say something new in it, and you can pray. We don't do it. I'm just telling you what's possible and what's not possible. Now, before time is finishing, I have a few more minutes. I'm going to tell you a story that I read. Once, you can do it if you sit there and do nothing. Sometimes when you have a doubt in a tefillah, you pray again and you say, if I'm obligated, shh, if I'm obligated, this will be my obligation. If I'm not obligated, there will be a donation, meaning I already did my obligation. Now it's going to be a donation. So you see, it's allowed. It wasn't allowed. Well, what do I care? I'm not, I'm not going to take a risk. Let me read to you something very interesting. It says like this. The Chafetz Chaim, in the name of the Gaon Rabbi Itzalem Ivolojin, Zatzal, he said, oh, based on the words of Chazal, that before Mashiach come, the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. Like the Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 49, the Gemara say, before Mashiach come, Pnei Ador ke Pnei Akelev. That's one of the signs that you know Mashiach is very close. 
What from all the two million animals, why Chazal compared the generation, our generation, to a dog and not to other animals? You want to say that the door is filthy? You want to say it's not spiritual? You want to say it's arrogant? Say pig! Why you chose a dog? Oh, so there are a few things about the dog that specifically made the Chachamim choose the dog as an example. One example is, if you come to a pig now and you kick him, what will he do? Nothing. He will move. He won't do anything. If you just walk next to a dog, someone has a dog in his private home, you walk on the sidewalk and he's by the fence. You just walk. You don't even look at him. Wow. He wants to rip you apart. You jump on the fence. Today, in the past, people knew how to behave. Everything was in the right. What do you say? Perspective? Yes. Today, you look at a person in the subway, he kills you. What are you looking at? You take someone's parking shoots you or comes with a baseball bat, smash your head. The things that are happening today, violence, it's not only physical violence, it's in the internet. Everyone is a bully. Look how people write comments on the news, reporters, editors. Everyone became murderers. Massive propaganda, which is massive machine that murders the public every second, and everyone joins the wagon, and everyone adds more lies and destroying the life of people. Who would ever believe that the world would be in such a low place? So one thing about the dog, no matter what, he wants to murder you and cut you to pieces when you did nothing to him. That's very, very specific to this generation. Second reason The dog is also a very foolish animal in a way. Sometimes it acts clever, but most of the time it's very foolish. Why it's foolish? When you take a stick and you hit the dog, the dog goes crazy and bites the stick. doesn't touch you. He tries to bite the stick, he jumps, he jumps. No matter where you move the stick, the dog is like crazy trying to bite the stick. If you throw the stick away, the dog would run after the stick and bark and go crazy. You fool. I am your enemy, not the stick. So what's the connection? Today, almost no one has a Muna. He did to me. He stole from me. He cheated me. He sued me. He took away my parnasa. He opened a business across the street. He owed me. He didn't pay me. He tricked me. He promised me. Nobody really understands. There's no such thing he and she and did to me. It's all baloney. It's all you and Hashem. You lost money. Hashem took it from you. You got a smack. Hashem took it away from you. An Arab killed you. Hashem killed you. There's no such thing. An Arab, he, the thief, the goy, the Jew. It's all an illusion. It's buttons in a, in the board of Hashem. Muhammad, it's one button. The dog is another button. Uh, your partner is another button. Your wife is another button. Your children is a button. Hashem can have so many ways to destroy you. The enemies of a person sometimes can be his own, his own family. His own children destroy him. How many parents are on the street because they have a drug addict kid? that forge their checks and credit cards and put them on the street and they lost everything they have. Or gamblers. Or, or, kind, or wives that destroyed the life of a, of a person. Cheated on him. Took away all his money. Sued him. Told the police he, he hit her or raped her or who knows what else. And he went to jail and she celebrated in his home with a guy that she's cheating with. And he's in jail. And I know one like this in a jail in Israel. You had to see how much he cries from morning to night. Spoke in a jail in Israel. Seven years he got in prison. He became religious. She didn't want to become religious. She started to tell stories about him. That's it. And I know body language. So when he talked to me, I know 100% is not lying. 
No. What can you do? Yeah, but in the end, it's all from Hashem. Why? We, we will never know for sure. We can assume it's from here. It's assume, we, we can assume many things. And we may even be right here and there. But Hashem wanted us not to know why I'm hitting you right now. Who hits you doesn't really matter. It's Muhammad or Chris or, or Yossi. What difference does it make? Someone made you lose money. Someone just hit you. Someone just stabbed you. Someone just wrote all kinds of things and lies about you. In the end, it got approved in my system. It came to me and I approved it. If I didn't want you to get it, I would let Muhammad touch you. The bullet wouldn't come to you. It would come to someone else. It came to your stomach. Why? I wanted you to get this bullet. Why your friend next to you didn't get it? How many cases like this you see? The planes is crashing, pieces flying all over. One guy made it, the other one nothing. Did not make it. One inch difference between them. Or that the bullet goes inside, another half an inch will be in the heart. Now he went to a place, soft tissue, nothing. All stitched and finished. Half an inch. Life and death. All the time. The answer about I... This generation, people already forgot completely that there is a God. And everything that happened, happened to, him, to us because he decided that we deserve it. Otherwise, we wouldn't get it. All the suffering you have, get used to say, I deserve it one million percent. But I say even better than that. When people ask you, how much a religious guy like you suffer? It's not fair. Answer... I deserve a million times more. You have no idea how much mercy Hashem has on me that He only gave me this punishment. That's how you're going to make it to a real good place when you die. Avraham Avinu, he deserved the suffering he had? When you read in the Torah, absolutely not. Did he ever complain? No. Yaakov complained. One time he complained, he got punished. Most of his life, he trusted Hashem 100%. All the legends that we read about them in the Torah, all of them suffered. Shimshon suffered. Yaakov suffered. Yitzhak suffered. Abraham suffered. Yosef suffered. Rachel suffered. Leah suffered. Dina suffered. All the brothers suffered. They had a very difficult life. Everybody suffered. Noah suffered. Slave. 120 years building an ark. This is what I came to the world here, to be a builder. And all the other things that happen in his life. So the idea is, since the world is a blink of the eye, it's here and it's, and it's not, in a minute, it's all gone. Grab as much as you can. So listen to what the Chafetz Chaim say. The Chafetz Chaim said, the dog bites the stick. He doesn't understand there's a hand who moves the stick. Instead of being angry at the Arabs that are messengers to give us what we deserve, Hafez Chaim, 100 years ago, the Arabs did not do to us 1% of what they're doing today. 100 years ago, you already wrote about it. Look at this. Why? The only thing you know is that Hashem punish us for, by wicked people, yes. He takes someone wicked and he uses him to do something negative. If Hashem uses you to destroy another Jew, that means you yourself not good. Why you don't use me to save Jews? Why I became a messenger of the Satan? Why you use me to fight this rabbi that is good? Why? I don't want to be a messenger of something negative. Use me for good things. Use me to build yeshivot. Use me to help the poor. Use me to teach Torah. This is what I want to be. I want to be a vessel to good things that comes to people. Not to be a policeman that takes people and put them in a cage. Even though they deserve it. Don't get me wrong. They deserve it 100%. But why me? You couldn't find from seven and a half billion people someone to do this dirty job to, to make people miserable, to make their children cry at home for 20 years. Why? I am the executor. The Chachamim did not execute a person even once in 70 years. 
I promise you thousands of them deserve to get execution probably every year. There were many people who make all kinds of idol worshipping and Chilulei Shabbat and who knows what. But they executed one person in seven years and in the end they moved out of Yerushalayim because they did not want to execute anyone, even though the Torah requires it. It's four mitzvot from the 613 commandments to execute people. It's mitzvah to execute the wicked. I don't want this kind of mitzvot. I will do everything I can to find contradiction between the witnesses that I will not kill him. You want to kill him, you kill him. And when they saw that they, there's too many cases, they just moved to Yavne. They left Bet HaMikdash, Sanhedrin. Why? Because from there, we cannot take him to execution. It says in the Torah, Me'et Mizbachit Ikachen Ulamut. You take him to the execution directly from the altar, meaning from Bet HaMikdash, from the temple, into the execution hill. Meaning, if I won't be here, I cannot fulfill this verse. If I'm in a different place. Here you go. It's a trick. Tricking Hashem. What, you're tricking me? Yes. I'm not going to be the executor. You want, you kill him. Make a tree fall on his head. Why should I throw him from the hill? This is the way, this is the right way to think. Not like today people volunteer to destroy others. Volunteer. So the Chafetz Chaim says, Megalgelim choval yede chayav. If you are guilty, Hashem uses you for negative. If you're righteous, good things will come to your hand. This is the rule. But you must get what you get with or without him. With the Arab, without the Arab. That's what you deserve. And today is when I say it, people get angry. Half of the Jews get going crazy. Going crazy when they hear what I just said. And it's simple verses in the Torah. The whole Torah is built on that. 13 principle of Judaism is built on that. Every chapter in the Gemara speaks about it almost. These people are so blind and so ignorant, they have no idea what, they even, what is the Torah even. When I was in LA, I gave a lecture over there on Saturday night. There was a brother and sister, not religious. As soon as I said that Hashem punish and it's from Hashem, you had to see the reaction, their body language. They almost went crazy. Even the claim that everything that happened is from Hashem, they cannot accept. Meaning it's all coincidence. There's no such thing. Righteous, wicked, he deserves it, he doesn't deserve it. There's no such thing. So the story goes like this. There is a pasuk, Aram mikedem uplishti me'achor vayochlu et Israel bechol peh. The Aramim from the east, the Philistines from the back, they come to eat the nation of Israel, meaning to destroy them. Ve'aam lo shav ad hamakehu, ve'et Hashem tzevaot lo darashu. This verse is a very important verse in the Tanakh. It's in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 11. Yeshayahu, chapter 9, verse 11. 9-11. Remember this verse. The Philistines coming to destroy us. The Aramim, they coming to destroy us. We don't have the strength to fight these monsters. And the nation did not return to the one that hit them. Who is hitting us? The Philistines. The Philistines are stick in my hand. Who are they? <laughs> I'm using them to hit you now. Arabs, Philistines, Aramaic, Christian, Hitler. I'm using them for what I decided to do to you. That's it. You don't want to believe it? Don't call yourself a religious Jew. Say you're an atheist. Okay, so you can, you can believe whatever you want. You want to be called religious Jew? There are principles. One of them is Hashem is behind everything. The nation did not return all the way to the one that hit them. Who is he? Hashem Tzvaot, God Almighty. Hashem Tzvaot, Lord Arashu. They did not request for Hashem. 
So what do you see from here the Chafetz Chaim say? The Philistines are my problem, the Arabs, the United Nations. How many times we repeat this nonsense? All of us, but no exception. Trump will be better, Obama was horrible, include me. But it's all baloney. Hashem wants us to pay the price. He sent us Obama to suffer for eight years. <laughs> now he decided to ease a little bit the choking. Send us somebody normal. They like the Jews. They talk nicely in the United Nations. Chas v'shalom, next year Hashem will decide otherwise. All of a sudden, these friends can turn into our enemies. <laughs> what is it? It's obvious, man. One Jew walked in the street and he saw a woman. She was dressed not modest. Do you know what not modest was 2,000 years ago? She wore a red jalabia. Snu, how do you call it? This the burqa. Covered, but red. Red is a color that attracts the eyes. And everyone see her now. But what's to see? She's covered with a blanket. What do you want? It's nothing to see. What do you see? You see a tent. He went and he ripped it from her to embarrass her on the street. <laughs> then they found out she wasn't Jewish. The bed didn't make him pay her. Another case, Maase was a woman walking in the street. She wasn't modest. He wanted to embarrass her. What did he do? He pulled out her cover. There was no wigs yet. So he pulled out whatever cover she had. Rabbi Akiva was the judge. She sued him in Bed Din. He says he embarrassed me in public. It was a very big embarrassment for a woman to show her hair to the public. Very big. They would go crazy not to do it. Rabbi Akiva told him, pay her 400 zoos. Do you know how much a husband give his wife in Ektuba in the time of the wedding? Huh? 200 zoos. It's a lot of money. 200 zoos is the amount of money that make you not poor anymore. Up to 200 zoos, you're poor. 200 zoos and up, you're not allowed to collect Sdaka for yourself. Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul said, in today's world, is one year of living. One year of support. One year, it's 200 zoos. He made him pay her 400 zoos, meaning support her for two years. It's a lot of money. If it's in Manhattan, it's $120,000. How can the one be judged? Just taking the cover out. Embarrassing on the, pub, on the public, 400 zoos. I'm reading to you the Gemara. It's Baba Kama, page, <coughs> page uh, 46, <coughs> chapter 8. <coughs> now listen carefully. Rabbi Akiva say, pay her 400 zoos. Huge amount of money. What did he do, this guy? After all, he was a clever guy. He took cream. Special cream, perfume, cheap, that women used to put, I guess, on their hair, I don't know, gel, whatever it was. Not for beauty, because anyone, and nobody see there anyway. But it gives great smell. You know, like, like instead of putting perfume on the body, they, I guess they put it in the hair. Or, and what did he do? He threw it. And he followed her with witnesses. And when she saw it, she picked it up. She took off her cover in the street. She put it on the hair and put it back. And the two witnesses saw it. Like today, camera. The detective, you made an insurance claim. They want to prove that you're healthy. They send a detective after you. Oh, he got you on tape. Running. <laughs> you're done. Your case is done. So, he comes back to the bed, Dean. He said to Rabbi Akiva, to this non-modest woman, you want me to give 400 zoos? She just did on her own. She took the cover and put hair in front of everyone on the street. 
Why she say I embarrassed her? She's a prutza, she's not modest. Rabbi Akiva told him, guess what? What would you do if now if you're the judge? Would you cancel your verdict or no? Yeah. <laughs> there are three possibilities. One, you cancel the verdict. I, you just made your case. It's a good appeal. Second, still pay her the money. Third, pay her more. Pay her more. For, for tricking her. You in court every day will give you the, the, the start. You start. No? Why? Why? Because you instigated that. You put it for her to do it. And if you do it, that's why she did it, so it's not your fault. It's right. In fact, yes, sir. No, but still, it's her choice. I didn't tell her to put the cream. It's always a choice, but you understand. One is a choice when you provoke it, you, you're doing it for her to do it, or you're making her to do it. One thing is she would well, volunteer. It's not the same thing. You're asking yourself. So my answer, keep the door. You spoke a lot, and in three words, he gave the answer. Chassid, I'm a clever Chassid. Just well, being a Chassid is not always. Chassid meaning compliment, not like you. I know, I know. <laughs> Ma, not like what? <laughs> not like you meaning. I mean, Chassid like. <laughs> I actually meant it as a compliment. So it's clever Chassid. He said it's not the same when you embarrass yourself, and someone else embarrasses you. Why? It's the same reaction, same transaction. If you're embarrassed to show your hair as a woman in the public, so when you embarrass yourself and someone else embarrass you, it should have been the same. What difference does it make if I do it or he does it? The, the reaction is the same, no? If people make fun at you, they'll make fun at you when you did it and when he did it. So if you're willing to take that embarrassment, it's really not an embarrassment. Today, when women walk with their hair out, they're embarrassed. It's a show off. All day. She wants people to look at her hair. Do you ever know a secular woman that feel embarrassed to walk with her hair on the street? She pays thousands of dollars for the hair stylist. Do it like this, do it like this. So, well, what's the embarrassment? Imagine now a, a non-religious woman. She was in the mood to put a baseball hat when she jogged. And one weirdo came and made the hat fly from her head. Now she sue him for embarrassing her. Why? Because he made me show my hair to the public. So the judge would tell her, are you normal? All, your, all the internet is full of your pictures with your hair. What, what is the, he made you show your hair. No? So it's a good case or no? Yeah. Rabbi Akiva say, lo al taklum. You did not change my verdict even a bit. Nothing, there's nothing you did. Someone that wants to embarrass himself, it's his business. But you still did not have permission to embarrass her. But I have a, a little problem with this verdict, even though I'm challenging the greatest Jew ever lived, Rabbi Akiva. But I'm asking, uh, you know, like an idiot. Why does Rabbi Akiva use the word embarrass? If she, do, she took it off, that means she's not embarrassed. So I did not embarrass her. If she would be very careful to push the cream like this, then it's a sign that it's really an embarrassment for her. But if she doesn't care to take it out, that means it's not even an embarrassment. So why are you saying that I embarrass her? He could have said to Rabbi Akiva, you're right, I did not have permission to do it, but now we just found out that it's not an embarrassment for her. Here you go. Who has an answer? Huh? So I wrote to myself when I read it, I wrote to myself a comment. Let's see. My answer to this question is, if a person is a fool, shote. Do you remember the expression shote? What's the definition of shote according to the Torah, according to Rashi? That you give him any amount of money and he throws it away. And he thinks he's doing something positive. Doesn't understand he loses all his money now in a minute. He cannot tell the difference between good and bad. That's the indication. By giving him hundreds of dollars bills and he starts giving them to the kids in the street, to people, anyone who asks. That means it's not normal. 
and a person like this that is a shote, and he, when he loses his money and he doesn't care, and one Jew came and stole from his pocket money, can he use it as a claim anyway he was giving out the money to people? So what's the problem if I took it from his pocket or from, or from his bag? Will we still judge the thief or no? 100% he's guilty from the Torah. He cannot say, this guy is a fool, he gives his money to the idol-worshipping church. I did him a favor by taking away his money. Now I give it to the synagogue. You cannot do it. If you go to a Jewish bedding, you have to pay him back the money. So the thief... Yes, that's also true. So the question is, even if this fool doesn't care to lose all his money, you still did not have permission to make him lose more money. He can lose his own money, but you cannot make him lose more money or steal from him money. That's the only answer I can come up with. Huh? Who did it before? Right. But who cares? But now we just found out that what we thought until now, it's incorrect. If I do something to you thinking you one thing, and then tomorrow we found out you are the opposite. And now when we found out, the rules changed. If we thought this guy is a great tzaddik, let's all run and do for him. And tomorrow we just found out he's a faker. Everything changed. Not only that, you're allowed to ask him back for the money you gave him. Tell them the money I gave you is based on thinking that you're going to really do good things with that. But now when I see you a gambler or a drug addict, give me back the money. He must give you back the money. It was a mekach ta'ut. It was based on mistake. Tishmeu tov, now I'm going to tell you a story that will send you home with tears. Just for that, it was worth it for you to come. Just give me two minutes and we finish. <laughs> you laughed a lot today, now you go home crying. In Rosh Hashanah, Shna Tafshin. What's Tafshin? What year is that? 700. Now we are 777. The story is 77 years ago. The Germans bombed Bialystok. It was a very important city with lots of rabbis and synagogues. In Lower East Side, there is an amazing shul, Bialystoker, Lower East Side. It's worth going to see it. It was built over 120 years ago, I believe. Amazing. Uh, you see how they build it, like in the old days. Beautiful piece of art. It uh, used to be a very, very hectic, lots of traffic shul, Bialystok over there. Today, it's a little bit different Lower East Side than what it used to be. So the Germans bombed the city Bialystok, and in a, in a holiday of Sukkot, instead of enjoying steaks and sitting in a sukkah and enjoying life, we had to run to Vilna, the middle of the holiday. Vilna was the capital city of Free Lithuania, Lita. Half a year after that, the Russian came and occupied Lita. And right away they made a rule, no yeshivas are permitted. Russian were communists, they hate religion. Our yeshiva went under the ground. We hid in a basement. It cannot be on the public. <coughs> Shabbat Kodesh, Parashat Shlach. We were told that the Russians are hunting religious Jews that learn Torah. Just like the time of the Romans, just like some of the Israelis do today in Israel, unfortunately. What for? If they catch a Bachur Yeshiva, they're going to send him immediately to where? To the Hilton Hotel, Jerusalem. To Siberia. With the Russians, there's no Hilton Hotel. Only Siberia. All my friends ran and hide all over. People were panicking. Torah, Torah, but I don't want to die. Everyone went and hide somewhere. I say to my Hevruta, I don't understand. It says in the Torah, Adam ki amut ba'oel. The Gemara say, you have to die for the Torah. 
Torah should be all your, all your life. You have to kill yourself be'o'ala shel Torah. Even a person, Rambam say, a person, mukeshkin, all his body is past, itching, handicaps, poor, doesn't have food for his children, must learn Torah. Person connected to machine, one hour to live, must learn Torah. In one hour you die. The doctor already said to the family, come say goodbye. That moment you have an obligation to learn Torah. It never expires until the last breath. So he said, he lived at Rav Galinsky. He lived like this. This is why it's, in a, it's a legend, this book. It's more precious than all the money on earth. If you read it, it make an impact on your life. How people in our generation live, in our time. He said to his friend, even in a time of death, a person should not prevent himself from going to learn Torah. It's Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page uh, 83. If your enemy come to, tor- to destroy you, hide yourself inside the Torah. Tzephon le'isharim tushia, like King Solomon wrote. The salvation will come from the Torah. We said the entire Shabbat and learned non-stop. Learned Gemara the whole Shabbat. Motzei Shabbat, we went back to the dorm. Just like with David HaMelech, like the Gemara said, the story of King David in Masechet Shabbat, page 30, that Malach HaMavet came to take his soul, but David was learning every Shabbat because Hashem already told him that he will die on Shabbat. So he knew once you learn Torah, you don't die. And he made noise back in the garden like someone just fell. David Amelech instantly got up to help someone. That second he took his soul. So he says, just like with David Amelech, when Malach Amavet got him a second that he stopped learning Torah on Shabbat, the angel of death knocked on our door. The Russian KJB are knocking now on the door. Imagine the fear now. Very cruel Amalekim. All our friends ran, started to run. People ran, jumping from the window everywhere. And of course, who did they catch? Me and my friend. We were able to grab our tefillin and few books. Nothing else, no clothes, no nothing. They took us right away to the train station. And we found few other friends of us that were caught after they ran. We're all now getting shipped. We're getting shipped to where? Siberia. When they saw us, other friends that saw us, they made fun. Oh, Yankale, Yankale, Shlemaizel. You know what Shlemaizel? Someone that always fell. Bad luck. You such a small, I don't know the right word. I don't want to offend. Midget or Dorf. Someone very small. He's such a small person. You could have hid yourself in a box. It was very, very short. Less, I believe shorter than five feet tall. So what are you? You're the only, the only one they caught first. They continue to hunt people all over. Like crazy. Look how much they wanted to stop people from learning Torah. The Russians. What, you, what is it your business what I'm learning in my house? Show you how the Satan works. They caught a few other nerds that do not, do not know how to be physical. And the other people escaped from the KJB. They took us to Siberia. Horrible work. Such torture. How much we were jealous with the rest of our friends from the yeshiva that escaped. We suffer hell here on earth every day from morning to night. They destroy us and they are free somewhere and have the life. Then the Germans came to Lita with all the groups, Plugota Mavet, the dead, the dead uh, wow. squads. But they didn't have too much work. Why? Based on the testimonies we heard later, the Lithuanian citizen got up and started to kill the Jews, one after the other. They didn't even wait for the Germans. 
they started to kill them. As soon as the German took over, they got confidence. Boom, they started to kill them. Rav Yaakov Kaminsky, another one of the biggest rabbis who ever lived in America. I once told you he lived 96 years old in Monsi. Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky told me that when he was young, he was in a small city called Tzitvian, next to Kelem. Saba mi Kelem, it was next to it. There were a few Jewish families in between the Goim farmers. The Goim, their farms, and few Jewish families, not too many. It was very hard to even get bread, not to starve to death. Very, very poor time. And he was forced to leave the place and to go overseas in a time of the war. He said the Lutuinian chopped their heads and their hands with axes. Imagine what a death. Shlak, like this. They took the Jewish people and chopped their heads off. Mamash, monsters. Not the Nazis. The Lutuinians. Not one of our lucky friends, lucky, that escaped the Russians, survived. They killed all of them. And we are locked in Siberia thinking we are jealous. Wow, they are free and we are dying here. While the war was still going on, we were released from the camp, from Siberia. In one condition, that we stay nearby and we are limited not to go anywhere. Don't move too much. Stay here and don't move. We were in a very bad situation. No food, skinny like skeleton. And we had the machalata typus. I don't know how to say it in English. It's all disease. Huh? Typhus? Wow, same word. Typhus. They all got sick with typhus. I was hospitalized in a hospital. Next to me, there was a strong Bachur Yeshiva, tall, strong, that also got the disease. Everyone say, Yankale, you don't have a chance with a body like you. You're so weak. Maybe this guy will survive. My neighbor, the big guy, passed. Before he passed, he told me, listen, I have money that I hid. And I know I'm going to die any minute. I'm giving you the money as a gift. That money saves my life. He died. I came back to be healthy. I went back to the dorm. They were they did not let me in the door. They're afraid that I have typhus. It was contagious. They didn't let me in. They say they burned all my belongings. They're afraid to get it. It's a contagious disease. I say, well, nobody knows me now. I have a little money. I have nothing left. Nothing left. I'm alone in the world. They all show that I'm still in the hospital. There's no record like today. You come to the computer, you know if he's out of the hospital or not. The, the, the Russians, they think I'm still in the hospital. Two weeks, I walk on the side of the train tracks. Because I don't know the way. There's no GPS. I know the train goes, I follow the track. Two weeks I walked, skinny like that. And I bought on the way bread that was exactly the money that the dead friend gave me. It was enough just to buy bread. A bite of bread, walking another few hours, another bite of bread. Two weeks later I arrived to Merka. I look for a house with mezuzah. They directed me from Shamayim to the house of the Shochet Rabbi Rot, a very warm, good heart Jew. Immediately he walked, he walked me into his house, and I found a lot of others, refugees, Jews that got saved from Russia, Lithuania, and Poland, and their children used to learn in uh, over there. There's no yeshiva. They all learn the communist ideology and the wicked people, I decided I must open a room to get these Jewish boys and start teach them Torah. Why are they going to Goish public school? I, um, they told me, you're crazy? 
you're going to open Yeshiva here? All the problems we have is from this. You're going to open under the KJB? They come to check every day over here. They're looking for people. But I'm from Novardok. Novardok people are stubborn. I found a little place to teach. A guy named Hanik. Arab. Muslim. Hanik. He hated the communists so much. The Arabs hate them also. He hated them so much, he was willing to risk his life for me, the Jew, to take the Jewish boys out of the communist education system. Imagine this. Look at this story. I went to convince the parents to give me their children that I will teach them Torah. It's a life risk. They said, the government gives us bread based on who goes to the public school here. That's how they know how many kids we have. If we'll take them out of the school, we won't have what to eat. We'll die. Listen to this test. It's pikuach nefesh. That's how we get our bread. There's only bread. There's nothing else to eat. Rabbi, sushi wasn't good. You promised pizza. Nothing to eat. I say to them, I'm going to get you that blue note. That with that you get bread. Bring your children to the yeshiva. Where will I get them the blue note? I had no idea where. Listen to this. There was a rumor that somebody broke into the government office and stole a bunch of blue notes. Blue notes, blue notes, it means you get bread. For each note, you get a piece of bread. I didn't know who do it, who did it. But I know that the Gemara say the mouse is not the thief. The whole of the mouth, that's the thief. What does it mean? That's the Gemara in Masechet Gitin. Also in Kiddushin. You have to find the hole. Cannot look for the mouse. They run all over. Find where they hide. Who was the hole? A Jew. He was selling in a black market. That's why. Like they buy tickets and they sell it to you in a stadium for double. I came to him. I said to him, what kind of a Jewish heart you have? You're not going to help me to get the Jewish boys and bring them into the yeshiva? He said, okay, I will sell it to you for cost price. I won't make profit on you. I started to collect penny by penny from people. Not a ruble here, ruble there. How much he said, he, 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 you have to understand in what physical situation he was, fighting between life and death, just came out of the hospital from almost dying. Skinny like skeleton, he runs to save those Jewish boys. I started to collect donations. Right away, something like this cannot be covered. Young Kale Galinsky is collecting donations, and all of a sudden Jewish boys coming out of the public, and they're not coming to school anymore. You cannot hide it. The government found out that I have a Talmud Torah underground. They found out that the parents receive blue notes, fake ones that came from me. They put me in jail. Now imagine if this would happen to us. What would we say? Where is God? I give my life to save his children. He puts me in jail? He couldn't help me. They put me in jail. What's the allegation? Black market stolen cars from the government. Death penalty. He's facing death penalty if he find gu- found guilty. It's not a joke. I'm in a cell waiting for hanging. They're going to hang me. But Mishamayim Hashem decided otherwise. Six months I was in a cell. When I was there, they, after six months they released me. All this time I was so jealous with people that are outside, free, and I'm stuck here in this cage. And I was comforting myself based on the words of the Gemara, Ashrai Shenit Pasti Al Divrei Torah. When Rabbi Akiva was put in jail, when he's 120 years old, Papus, 
one of the Jews, secular, whatever, he said to him, Ashrecha Akiva, we bought in jail, but at least you got caught for giving your life to teach Torah. What am I in jail for? You at least go to heaven. Where will I go? So from here we have an important expression, Ashrecha Shenit Pasta Al Divrei Torah. How lucky you are that you got caught for teaching Torah. It's a very big honor. So, when they released me from jail, I found out that the Russian government came to an agreement with the Poland government, the government that was in exile in London. There was a Polish government that were kicked out of Poland. They sit in London. That they came to, the Russian came to an agreement with this exile government of Poland that all their Polish citizens that live on their territory will join the war against the Germans. They must be in the army fighting against the Nazis. All my friends were forced to join the Russian army. They took them to dig holes and make roads. And all day the Germans were shooting them. Many of them died while I was sitting in prison six months. Almost all his friends died. Look how when your life looks like it's the biggest nightmare, how much Hashem is doing for him. The only safe place was sitting there six months in a jail. Facing death, it drives you crazy. Any day they come and hang you. And he was there. And in the end he made it. He came to Eretz Israel and became... One of the greatest rabbis of our generation, Rav Yaakov Galinsky. This is a very good book. It has many of them, maybe 15 on Bereshit, Shmot. Lots of wonderful divrei Torah that are relevant to our time. Very inspiring, very encouraging. Bezrat Hashem, we have one more lecture before Pesach. Don't forget, sorry that we went a little bit too far today. Too long, I mean. We'll see you next Tuesday for final lecture, 8.15. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen Ve'Amen. Oh, wait, one announcement, excuse me, I always forget. Our friend Baruch Haim of Ken from Queens, he runs around. He has now an organization that set up Shiduchim for Orthodox people. Everyone that is Shomer Shabbat and is religious is welcome to sign a paper over there. You can tell your friends there's flyers over there. Everyone that is single looking for a Shiduch, it's very recommended. Thank you. How are you? I missed you lecture a lot. Thank you. I know. Thank you very much.